Preface to the Book of Common Prayer, 1662, as approved by the Parliament of England. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Michael Manx. The Preface It hath been the wisdom of the Church of England, ever since the first compiling of her public liturgy, to keep the mean between the two extremes, of too much stiffness in refusing, and of too much easiness in admitting any variation from it. For, as on the one side common experience showeth, that where a change hath been made of things advisedly established, no evident necessity so requiring, sundry inconveniences have thereupon ensued, and those many times more and greater than the evils that were intended to be remedied by such change. So, on the other side, the particular forms of divine worship, and the rites and ceremonies appointed to be used therein, being things in their own nature indifferent and alterable, and so acknowledged, it is but reasonable that upon weighty and important considerations, according to the various exigency of times and occasions, such changes and alterations should be made therein, as to those that are in place of authority, should from time to time deem either necessary or expedient. Accordingly, we find that in the reigns of several princes of blessed memory since the Reformation, the Church, upon just and weighty considerations her thereunto moving, hath yielded to make such alterations in some particulars as in their responsive times were thought convenient. Yet so, as that the main body and essentials of it, as well as in the chiefest materials, as in the frame and order thereof, have still continued the same unto this day, and do yet stand firm and unshaken, notwithstanding all the vain attempts and impetuous assaults made against it by such men as are given to change, and have always discovered a greater regard to their own private fancies and interests than to that duty they owe to the public. By what undue means and for what mischievous purposes the use of the liturgy, though enjoined by the laws of the land and those laws never yet repealed, came, during the late unhappy confusions to be discontinued, is too well known to the world, and we are not willing here to remember. But when, upon his majesty's happy restoration, it seemed probable that, amongst other things, the use of the liturgy also would return, of course, the same never having been legally abolished, unless some timely means were used to prevent it, those men who under the late usurped powers had made it a great part of their business to render the people disaffected thereunto, saw themselves in point of reputation and interest concerned, unless they would freely acknowledge themselves to have erred, which such men are very hardly brought to do, with their utmost endeavours to hinder the restitution thereof. In order whereunto, Diverse pamphlets were published against the Book of Common Prayer. The old objections mustered up, with the addition of some new ones more than formerly have been made to make the number swell. In fine, great importunities were used to his sacred majesty that the said book might be revised, and such alterations therein, and additions thereunto made, as should be thought requisite for the ease of tender consciences whereunto his majesty, out of his pious inclination to give satisfaction, so far as could reasonably be expected, to all his subjects of whatever persuasion soever, did graciously condescend. In which review we have endeavoured to observe the like moderation, as we find to have been used in the like case in former times. And, therefore, of the sundry alterations proposed unto us, we have rejected all such as either were of dangerous consequence, as secretly striking at some established doctrine or laudable practice of the Church of England, or indeed of the whole Catholic Church of Christ, or else of no consequence at all, but utterly frivolous and vain. But such alterations as were tended to us, by what persons, under what pretences, or to what purpose soever tendered, 
as seemed to us in any degree requisite or expedient, we have willingly and of our own accord assented unto. Not enforced so to do by any strength of argument convincing us of the necessity of making the said alterations. For we are fully persuaded in our judgments, and here we profess it to the world, that the book, as it stood before, established by law, doth not contain in it anything contrary to the word of God, or to found doctrine, or which a godly man may not with a good conscience use and submit unto, or which is not fairly defensible against any that shall oppose the same, if it shall be allowed such just and favourable construction, as in common equity ought to be allowed to all human writings, especially such as are set forth by authority, and even to the very best translations of the Holy Scripture itself. Our general aim, therefore, in this undertaking, was not to gratify this or that party in any their unreasonable demands, but to do that which, to our best understandings, we conceived might most tend to the preservation of peace and unity in the Church, the procuring of reverence, and exciting of piety and devotion in the public worship of God, and the cutting off occasion from them that seek occasion of cavil or quarrel against the liturgy of the Church. And as to the several variations from the former book, whether by alteration, addition, or otherwise, it shall suffice to give this general account, that most of the alterations were made either first for the better direction of them that are to officiate in any part of divine service, which is chiefly done in the calendars in rubrics, or secondly, for the more proper expressing of some words or phrases of ancient usage in terms more suitable to the language of the present times, and the clearer explanation of some other words and phrases that were either of doubtful signification or otherwise liable to misconstruction, or thirdly, for a more perfect rendering of such portions of Holy Scripture as are inserted into the liturgy, which, in the Epistles and Gospels especially, and in sundry other places, are now ordered to be read according to the last translation. And that it was thought convenient that some prayers and thanksgivings, fitted to special occasions, should be added in their due places, particularly for those at sea, together with an office for the baptism of such as are of riper years, which, although not so necessary when the former book was compiled, yet by the growth of Anabaptism through the licentiousness of the late times crept in amongst us, is now become necessary, and may be always useful for the baptising of natives in our plantations and others converted to the faith. If any man who shall desire a more particular account of the several alterations in any part of the liturgy shall take the pains to compare the present book with the former, we doubt not but the reason of the change may easily appear. And having thus endeavoured to discharge our duties in this weighty affair as in the sight of God, and to approve our sincerity therein, so far as lay in us, to the consciences of all men, Although we know it impossible, in such variety of apprehensions, humours, and interests as are in the world, to please all, nor can expect that men of factious, peevish, and perverse spirit should be satisfied with anything that can be done in this kind by any other than themselves. Yet we have good hope that what is here presented, and hath been by the convocations of both provinces, with great diligence examined and approved, will be also well accepted and approved by all sober, peaceable, and truly conscientious sons of the Church of England. Concerning the Service of the Church There was never anything established by the wit of man so well devised, or so sure established, which in continuance of time hath not been corrupted as, among other things, it may plainly appear by the common prayers in the church, commonly called divine service. 
the first original and ground whereof, if a man would search out by the ancient fathers, he shall find that the same was not ordained, but of a good purpose, and for a great advancement of godliness. For they so ordered the matter, that all the whole Bible, or the greatest part thereof, should be read over every year, intending thereby that the clergy, and especially such as were ministers in the congregation, should, by often reading a meditation in God's word, be stirred up to godliness themselves, and be more able to exhort others by wholesome doctrine, and to confute them that were adversaries to the truth. And further, that the people, by daily hearing of Holy Scripture read in the church, might continually profit more and more in the knowledge of God, and be the more inflamed with the love of his true religion. But these many years past, this godly and decent order of the ancient fathers hath been so altered, broken, and neglected by planting in uncertain stories and legends, with multitude of responses, verses, vain repetitions, commemorations, and synodals, that commonly, when any book of the Bible was begun, after three or four chapters were read out, all the rest were unread. And in this sort, the book of Isaiah was begun in Advent, and the book of Genesis in Septuagesima, but they were only begun and never read through. After like sort were other books of the Holy Scripture used. And moreover, whereas St. Paul would have such language spoken to the people in the church as they might understand and have profit by hearing the same, the service in this Church of England these many years hath been read in Latin to the people, which they understand not, so that they have heard with their ears only, and their heart, spirit, and mind have not been edified thereby. And furthermore, notwithstanding that the ancient fathers have divided the Psalms into seven portions, whereof every one was called a nocturne, now, of late time, a few of them have been daily said, and the rest utterly omitted. Moreover, the number and hardness of the rules called the pie, and the manifold changings of the service was the cause, that to turn the book only was so hard and intricate a matter, that many times there was more business to find out what should be read, than to read it when it was found out. These inconveniences therefore considered, here is set forth such an order whereby the same shall be redressed. And for a readiness in this matter, here is drawn out a calendar for that purpose, which is plain and easy to be understood, wherein, so much as may be, the reading of the Holy Scripture is so set forth, and all things shall be done in order, without breaking one piece from another. For this cause be cut off anthems, responds, invitatories, and such like things as did break the continual course of the reading of the Scripture. Yet, because there is no remedy but that of necessity, there must be some rules. Therefore certain rules are here set forth, which, as they are few in number, so are they plain and easy to be understood. So that here you have an order for prayer, and for the reading of the Holy Scripture, much agreeable to the mind and purpose of the old fathers, and a great deal more profitable and commodious than that which of late was used. It is more profitable, many things whereof some are untrue, because here are left out some uncertain, some vain and superstitious, and nothing is ordained to be read but the very pure word of God, the Holy Scriptures, or that which is agreeable to the same, and that in such a language and order as is most easy and plain for the understanding both of the readers and hearers. It is also more commodious, both for the shortness thereof, and for the plainness of the order, and for that the rules be few and easy. And whereas heretofore there hath been great diversity in saying and singing in churches within this realm, some following Salisbury use, some Hereford use, and some the use of Bangor, some of York, some of Lincoln, now from henceforth all the whole realm shall have but one use. 
and for as much as nothing can be so plainly set forth but doubts may arise in the use and practice of the same, to appease all such diversity, if any arise, and for the resolution of all doubts concerning the manner how to understand, do, and execute the things contained in this book, the parties that so doubt, or diversity take anything, shall always resort to the bishop of the diocese, who, by his discretion, shall take order for the quieting and appeasing of the same, so that the same order be not contrary to anything in this book. And if the bishop of the diocese be in doubt, then he may send for the resolution thereof to the archbishop. Though it be appointed that all things shall be said and sung in the church in the English tongue, to the end that the congregation may be thereby edified, yet it is not meant but that when men say morning and evening prayer privately, they may say the same in any language that they themselves do understand. And all priests and deacons are to say daily the morning and evening prayer, either privately or openly, not being let by sickness or some other urgent cause. And the curate that ministereth in every parish church or chapel, being at home, and not being otherwise reasonably hindered, shall say the same in the parish church or chapel where he ministereth, and shall cause a bell to be told thereunto, a convenient time before he begin, that the people may come to hear God's word, and to pray with him. Of Ceremonies why some be abolished, and some retained. Of such ceremonies as be used in the church, and have their beginning by the institution of man, some at the first were of godly intent and purpose devised, and yet at length turned to vanity and superstition. Some entered into the church by undiscreet devotion, and such a zeal as without knowledge, and for because they were winked at in the beginning, they grew daily to more and more abuses, which, not only for their unprofitableness, but also because they have much blinded the people, and obscured the glory of God, are worthy to be cut away and clean rejected. Others there be, which, although they have been devised by man, yet it is thought good to reserve them still, as well for a decent order in the church for the which they were first devised, as because they pertain to edification, whereunto all things done in the church, as the apostle teacheth, ought to be referred. And although the keeping or omitting of a ceremony in itself considered is but a small thing, yet the willful and contemptuous transgression and breaking of a common order and discipline is of no small offence before God, let all things be done among you, saith St. Paul, in a seemly and due order. The appointment of the which order pertaineth not to private men. Therefore, no man ought to take in hand, nor to presume to appoint or alter any public or common order in Christ's church, except he be lawfully called and authorised thereunto. And whereas in this our time the minds of men are so diverse that some think it a matter of great conscience to depart from a piece of the least of their ceremonies, they be so addicted to their old customs. And again, on the other side, some be so new-fangled that they would innovate all things and so despise the old that nothing can like them but that is new. It was thought expedient not so much to have respect how to please and satisfy either of these parties, as to how to please God and profit them both. And yet, lest any man should be offended whom reason might satisfy, here be certain causes rendered why some of the accustomed ceremonies be put away, and some retained and kept still. Some are put away because the great excess and multitude of them hath so increased in these latter days that the burden of them was intolerable, whereof St. Augustine in his time complained that they were grown to such a number that the estate of Christian people was in worse case concerning that matter than were the Jews. And he counselled that such yoke and burden should be taken away, as time would serve quietly to do it. 
But what would St. Augustine have said, if he had seen the ceremonies of late days used among us, whereunto the multitude used in his time was not to be compared? This our excessive multitude of ceremonies was so great, and many of them so dark, that they did more confound and darken than declare and set forth Christ's benefits unto us. And besides this, Christ's gospel is not a ceremonial law, as much of Moses' law was, but it is a religion to serve God, not in bondage of the figure or shadow, but in the freedom of the Spirit, being content only with those ceremonies which do serve to a decent order and godly discipline and such as be apt to stir up the dull mind of man to the remembrance of his duty to God, by some notable and special signification whereby he might be edified. Furthermore, the most weighty cause of the abolishment of certain ceremonies was that they were so far abused, partly by the superstitious blindness of the rude and unlearned, and partly by the unsatiable avarice of such a sort more their own lucre than the glory of God, that the abuses could not well be taken away, the thing remaining still. But now, as concerning those persons which peradventure will be offended for that some of the old ceremonies are retained still, if they consider that without some ceremonies it is not possible to keep order or quiet discipline in the church, they shall easily perceive just cause to reform their judgments. And if they think much that any of the old do remain and would rather have all devised anew, then such men granting some ceremonies convenient to be had, surely where the old may well be used, there they cannot reasonably reprove the old only for their age, without betraying of their own folly. For in such a case, they ought rather to have reverence unto them for their antiquity, if they will declare themselves to be more studious of unity and concord than of innovations and newfangledness, which, as much as may be with the true setting forth of Christ's religion, is always to be eschewed. Furthermore, such shall have no just cause with the ceremonies reserved to be offended. For as those be taken away which were most abused, and did burden men's consciences without any cause, so the other that remain are retained for a discipline and order, which, upon just causes, may be altered and changed, and therefore are not to be esteemed equal with God's law. And moreover, they be neither dark or dumb ceremonies, but are so set forth that every man may understand what they do mean, and to what use they do serve, so that it is not like that they in time to come should be abused as others have been. And in these our doings we condemn no other nations, nor prescribe anything but to our own people only. For we think it convenient that every country should use such ceremonies as they shall think best to the setting forth of God's honour and glory, and to the reducing of the people to a most perfect and godly living without error or superstition, and that they should put away other things which from time to time they perceive to be most abused, as in men's ordinances it often chances diversely in diverse countries. The order how the Psalter is appointed to be read. The Psalter shall be read through once every month as it is there appointed, both for morning and evening prayer. But in February it shall be read only to the 28th or the 29th day of the month. And whereas January, March, May, July, August, October, and December have one and thirty days apiece, it is ordered that the same psalm shall be read the last day of the said months which were read the day before, so that the Psalter may begin again the first day of the next month ensuing. And whereas the 119th psalm is divided into twenty-two portions, and is over long to be read at one time, 
it is so ordered that at one time shall not be read above four or five of the said portions. And at the end of every psalm, and of every such part of the hundred and nineteenth psalm, shall be repeated this hymn. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Note that the Psalter followeth the division of the Hebrews and the translation of the great English Bible, set forth and used in the time of King Henry the Eighth and Edward the Sixth. The order how the rest of Holy Scripture is appointed to be read. The Old Testament is appointed for the first lessons at morning and evening prayer, so as the most part thereof will be read every year once, as in the calendar is appointed. The New Testament is appointed for the second lessons at morning and evening prayer, and shall be read over orderly every year thrice, besides the Epistles and Gospels, except the Apocalypse, out of which there are only certain proper lessons appointed upon diverse feasts. And to know what lessons shall be read every day, look for the day of the month in the calendar following, and there ye shall find the chapters, and that shall be read for the lessons both at morning and evening prayer, except only the movable feasts which are not in the calendar, and the immovable, where there is a blank left in the column of lessons, the proper lessons for all which days are to be found in the table of the proper lessons. Table of Lessons from the Four Gospels And note that whensoever proper psalms or lessons are appointed, then the psalms or lessons of ordinary course appointed in the Psalter and Calendar, if they be different, shall be omitted for that time. Note also that the Collect, Epistle and Gospel appointed for the Sunday shall serve all the week after, where it is not in this book otherwise ordered. End of the Preface The Order for Morning Prayer From The Book of Common Prayer, 1662 This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Michael Max. The Order for Morning Prayer Daily Throughout the Year At the beginning of morning prayer, the minister shall read with a loud voice one or more of these sentences of the scriptures that follow, and then he shall say that which is written after the said sentences. When the wicked man turneth away from his wickedness that he has committed, and doeth that which is lawful and right, he shall save his soul alive. Ezekiel 18 verse 27 I acknowledge my transgressions, and my sin is ever before me. Psalms 51 verse 3 Hide thy face from my sins, and blot out all mine iniquities. Psalms 51 verse 9 The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O God, that wilt not despise. Psalms 51 verse 17 Rend your heart and not your garments, and turn unto the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness and repenteth him of the evil. Joel 2 verse 13 To the Lord our God belong mercies and forgiveness. Though we have rebelled against him, neither have we obeyed the voice of the Lord our God to walk in his laws which he set before us. Daniel 9 verses 9 and 10 O Lord, correct me, but with judgment, not in thine anger, lest thou bring me to nothing. Jeremiah 10, verse 24, Psalms 6, verse 1. Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. St. Matthew 3, verse 2. I will arise and go to my father, and will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee, and am no more worthy to be called thy son. St. Luke 15, verses 18 and 19. Enter not into judgment with thy servant, O Lord, for in thy sight shall no man living be justified. Psalms 143 verse 2 If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. 
But if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. 1 St. John 1 verses 8 and 9 Dearly beloved brethren, the scripture moveth us in sundry places to acknowledge and confess our manifold sins and wickedness, and that we should not dissemble nor cloak them before the face of Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, but confess them with an humble, lowly, penitent and obedient heart, to the end that we may obtain forgiveness of the same by his infinite goodness and mercy. And though we ought at all times humbly to acknowledge our sins before God, yet ought we most chiefly so to do when we assemble and meet together to render thanks for the great benefits that we have received at his hands, to set forth his most worthy praise, to hear his most holy word, and to ask those things that are requisite and necessary, as well for the body as for the soul. Wherefore I pray and beseech you, as many as are here present, to accompany me with a pure heart and humble voice unto the throne of the heavenly grace, saying after me, A general confession to be said of the whole congregation after the minister, all kneeling. Almighty and most merciful Father, we have erred and strayed from thy ways like lost sheep. We have followed too much the devices and desires of our own hearts. We have offended against thy holy laws. We have left undone those things which we ought to have done, and we have done those things which we ought not to have done, and there is no health in us. But thou, O Lord, have mercy upon us miserable offenders. Spare thou them, O God, which confess their fault. Restore thou them that are penitent. According to thy promises declared unto mankind, in Christ Jesus our Lord. And grant, O most merciful Father, for his sake, that we may hereafter live a godly, righteous, and sober life. To the glory of thy holy name. Amen. The absolution or remission of sins to be pronounced by the priest alone, standing, the people still kneeling. Almighty God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who desireth not the death of a sinner, but rather that he may turn from his wickedness and live, and has given power and commandment to his ministers to declare and pronounce to his people, being penitent, the absolution and remission of their sins. He pardoneth and absolveth all them that truly repent and unfeignedly believe his holy gospel. Wherefore, let us beseech him to grant us true repentance and his Holy Spirit, that those things may please him which we do at this present, and that the rest of our life hereafter may be pure and holy. So at the last we may come to his eternal joy, through Jesus Christ our Lord. The people shall answer here, and at the end of all prayers, Amen. Then the minister shall kneel and say the Lord's Prayer with an audible voice, the people also kneeling and repeating it with him, both here and wheresoever else it is used in divine service. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive them that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Then likewise he shall say, O Lord, open thou our lips. Answer. And our mouth shall show forth thy praise. Priest. O God, make speed to save us. Answer. O Lord, make haste to help us. Here, all standing up, the priest shall say, Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost. Answer. As it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Priest. Praise ye the Lord. Answer. 
the Lord's name be praised. Then shall be said or sung this psalm following, except on Easter day upon which another answer is appointed, and on the nineteenth day of every month it is not to be read here, but in the ordinary course of the psalms. Venite exultamus domino, Psalms 95 O come, let us sing unto the Lord. Let us heartily rejoice in the strength of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving, and show ourselves glad in him with psalms. For the Lord is a great God, and a great King above all gods. In his hands are all the corners of the earth, and the strength of the hills is his also. The sea is his, and he made it, and his hands prepared the dry land. O come, let us worship and fall down, and kneel before the Lord our Maker. For he is the Lord our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Today, if ye will hear his voice, harden not your hearts, as in the provocation, as in the day of temptation in the wilderness, when your fathers tempted me, proved me, and saw my works. Forty years long was I grieved with this generation, and said, It is a people that do err in their hearts, for they have not known thy ways. Unto whom I swear in my wrath, that they should not enter into my rest. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Then shall follow the Psalms in order as they be appointed, and at the end of every Psalm throughout the year, and likewise in the end of Benedicity, Benedictus, Magnificat, and Nunc Dimittis, shall be repeated, Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost. Answer. As it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Then shall be read distinctly with an audible voice the first lesson, taken out of the Old Testament, as it is appointed in the calendar, except there be proper lessons assigned for that day. He that readeth so standing and turning himself, as he may be heard of all such as are present. And after that shall be said or sung in English the hymn called Te Deum Laudamus, daily throughout the year. Note that before every lesson the minister shall say, Here beginneth such a chapter, or verse of such a chapter, of such a book. And after every lesson, here endeth the first, or the second, lesson. Te Deum Laudamus We praise Thee, O God, we acknowledge Thee to be the Lord. All the earth doth worship Thee, the Father everlasting. To Thee all angels cry aloud, the heavens and all the powers therein. To Thee cherubim and seraphim continually do cry, Holy, 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 Lord God of Sabaoth. Heaven and earth are full of the majesty of Thy glory. The glorious company of the apostles praise Thee. The goodly fellowship of the prophets, praise thee. The noble army of martyrs, praise thee. The holy church throughout all the world doth acknowledge thee. The Father of an infinite majesty, thine adorable, true, and only Son, also the Holy Ghost, the Comforter. Thou art the King of glory, O Christ. Thou art the everlasting Son of the Father. When thou tookest upon thee to deliver man, thou didst not abhor the virgin's womb. When thou hadst overcome the sharpness of death, thou didst open the kingdom of heaven to all believers. Thou sittest at the right hand of God in the glory of the Father. We believe that thou shalt come to be our judge. We therefore pray thee, help thy servants, whom thou hast redeemed with thy precious blood. Make them to be numbered with thy saints, in glory everlasting. O Lord, 
save thy people, and bless thine heritage. Govern them, and lift them up for ever. Day by day we magnify thee, and we worship thy name ever, world without end. Vouchsafe, O Lord, to keep us this day without sin. O Lord, have mercy upon us, have mercy upon us. O Lord, let thy mercy lighten upon us, as our trust is in thee. O Lord, in thee have I trusted, let me never be confounded. Or this canticle, Benedicti Omnia Opera. All ye works of the Lord, bless ye the Lord. Praise him and magnify him for ever. O ye angels of the Lord, bless ye the Lord. Praise him and magnify him for ever. O ye heavens, bless the Lord. Praise him and magnify him for ever. O ye waters that be above the firmament, bless ye the Lord. Praise him and magnify him for ever. O all ye powers of the Lord, bless you the Lord. Praise him and magnify him for ever. O ye sun and moon, bless you the Lord. Praise him and magnify him for ever. O ye stars of heaven, bless you the Lord. Praise him and magnify him for ever. O ye showers and dew, bless you the Lord. Praise him and magnify him for ever. O ye winds of God, bless ye the Lord. Praise him and magnify him for ever. O ye fire and heat, bless ye the Lord. Praise him and magnify him for ever. O ye winter and summer, bless ye the Lord. Praise him and magnify him for ever. O ye dews and frosts, bless ye the Lord. Praise him and magnify him for ever. O ye frost and cold, bless ye the Lord. Praise him and magnify him for ever. O ye ice and snow, bless ye the Lord. Praise him and magnify him for ever. O ye nights and days, bless ye the Lord. Praise him and magnify him for ever. O ye light and darkness, bless ye the Lord. Praise him and magnify him for ever. O ye lightnings and clouds, bless ye the Lord. Praise him and magnify him for ever. O let the earth bless the Lord. Yea, let it praise him and magnify him for ever. O ye mountains and hills, bless ye the Lord. Praise him and magnify him for ever. O all ye green things upon the earth, bless ye the Lord. Praise him and magnify him for ever. O ye wells, bless ye the Lord. Praise him and magnify him for ever. O ye seas and floods, bless ye the Lord. Praise him and magnify him for ever. O ye whales and all that move in the waters, bless ye the Lord. Praise him and magnify him for ever. O all ye fowls of the air, bless ye the Lord. Praise him and magnify him for ever. O all ye beasts and cattle, bless ye the Lord. Praise him and magnify him for ever. O ye children of men, bless ye the Lord. Praise him and magnify him for ever. O let Israel bless the Lord. Praise him and magnify him for ever. O ye priests of the Lord, bless ye the Lord. Praise him and magnify him for ever. O ye servants of the Lord, bless ye the Lord. Praise him and magnify him for ever. O ye spirits and souls of the righteous, bless ye the Lord. Praise him and magnify him for ever. O ye holy and humble men of heart, bless ye the Lord. Praise him and magnify him for ever. O Ananias, Azarias, and Misael, bless ye the Lord. Praise him and magnify him for ever. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Then shall be read in like manner the second lesson, 
taken out of the New Testament, and after that the hymn following, except when that shall happen to be in the chapter for the day or for the gospel on St. John Baptist's day. Benedictus, St. Luke 1, verse 68 Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people, and he has raised up a mighty salvation for us in the house of his servant David. And he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets, which have been since the world began, that we should be saved from our enemies, from the hand of all that hate us, to perform the mercy promised to our forefathers, and to remember his holy covenant, to perform the oath which he sware to our forefather Abraham that he would give us, that we, being delivered out of the hands of our enemies, might serve him without fear, in holiness and righteousness before him all the days of our life. And thou, child, shalt be called the prophet of the highest, for thou shalt go before the face of the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation unto his people for the remission of their sins, through the tender mercy of our God, whereby the day spring from on high hath visited us, to give light to them that sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the way of peace. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. All this psalm, Jubilate Deo, Psalms 100. Be joyful in the Lord, all ye lands. Serve the Lord with gladness, and come before his presence with a song. Be ye sure that the Lord, he is God. It is he who hath made us, and not we ourselves. We are his people, and the sheep of his pasture. O oh, go your way into his gates with thanksgiving, and into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him, and speak good of his name. For the Lord is gracious, his mercy is everlasting, and his truth endureth from generation to generation. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Then shall be sung or said the Apostles' Creed, by the minister and the people standing, except only such days as the creed of St. Athanasius is appointed to be read. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered unto Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven, and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And after that, these prayers following all devoutly kneeling, the minister first pronouncing with a loud voice, The Lord be with you. Answer, and with thy spirit. Minister, let us pray. Lord, have mercy upon us. Christ, have mercy upon us. Lord, have mercy upon us. Then the minister, clerks, and people shall say the Lord's Prayer with a loud voice. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive them that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Then the priest, standing up, shall say, O Lord, show thy mercy upon us. Answer, and grant us thy salvation. Priest, 
O Lord, save the King. Answer, and mercifully hear us when we call upon thee. Priest, endue thy ministers with righteousness. Answer, and make thy chosen people joyful. Priest, O Lord, save thy people. Answer, and bless thine inheritance. Priest, give peace in our time, O Lord. Answer, because there is none other that fighteth for us, but only thou, O God. Priest, O God, make clean our hearts within us. Answer, and take not thy Holy Spirit from us. Then shall follow three collects, the first of the day, which shall be the same that is appointed at the communion, the second for peace, the third for grace to live well, and the two last collects shall never alter, but be daily said at morning prayer throughout all the year, as followeth, all kneeling. The second collect for peace. O God, who art the author of peace and lover of concord, in knowledge of whom standeth our eternal life, whose service is perfect freedom. Defend us, thy humble servants, in all assaults of our enemies, that we, surely trusting in thy defence, may not fear the power of any adversaries. Through the might of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The Third Collect for Grace O Lord, our Heavenly Father, almighty and everlasting God, who hath safely brought us to the beginning of this day. Defend us in the same with thy mighty power, and grant that this day we fall into no sin, neither run into any kind of danger, but that all our doings, being ordered by thy government, may be righteous in thy sight. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. In choirs and places where they sing, here followeth the anthem. Then these five prayers following are to be read here, except when the litany is read, and then only the two last are to be read, as they are there placed. A prayer for the King's Majesty. O Lord, our Heavenly Father, High and Mighty, King of Kings, Lord of Lords, the only Ruler of Princes, who dost from thy throne behold all the dwellers upon earth, most heartily we beseech thee, with thy favour, to behold our most gracious sovereign lord, King George, and so replenish him with the grace of thy Holy Spirit, that he may always incline to thy will and walk in thy way. Endue him plenteously with heavenly gifts. Grant him in health and wealth long to live. Strengthen him that he may vanquish and overcome all his enemies. And finally, after this life he may attain everlasting joy and felicity. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. A prayer for the royal family. Almighty God, the fountain of all goodness, we humbly beseech thee to bless our gracious Queen Charlotte, her Royal Highness, Princess Dowager of Wales, and all the royal family. Endue them with thy Holy Spirit, Enrich them with thy heavenly grace, prosper them with all happiness, and bring them to thine everlasting kingdom. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. A prayer for the clergy and people. Almighty and everlasting God, who alone workest great marvels, send down upon our bishops and curates and all congregations committed to their charge the healthful spirit of thy grace, that they may truly please thee. Pour upon them the continual dew of thy blessing. Grant this, O Lord, for the honour of our Advocate and Mediator, Jesus Christ. Amen. A Prayer of St. Chrysostom Almighty God, who has given us grace at this time with one accord to make our common supplications unto thee, and dost promise that when two or three are gathered together in thy name, thou wilt grant their requests. Fulfil now, O Lord, the desires and petitions of thy servants, as may be most expedient for them, granting us in this world knowledge of thy truth, and in the world to come life everlasting. Amen. 
2 Corinthians, verses 13 and 14. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Ghost be with us all evermore. Amen. Here endeth the order of morning prayer throughout the year. End of the order of morning prayer. The order for evening prayer from the Book of Common Prayer, 1662. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Michael Maggs. The order for evening prayer daily throughout the year. At the beginning of evening prayer, the minister shall read with a loud voice one or more of these sentences of the scriptures that follow. Then he shall say that which is written after the said sentences. When the wicked man turneth away from his wickedness that he hath committed, and doeth that which is lawful and right, he shall save his soul alive. Ezekiel 18, verse 27 I acknowledge my transgressions, and my sin is ever before me. Psalms 51, verse 3 Hide thy face from my sins, and blot out all mine iniquities. Psalms 51, verse 9 the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart, O God, thou wilt not despise. Psalms 51 verse 17 Rend your heart and not your garments, and turn unto the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness, and repenteth him of the evil. Joel 2 verse 13 to the Lord our God belong mercies and forgiveness, though we have rebelled against him. Neither have we obeyed the voice of the Lord our God to walk in his laws which he set before us. Daniel 9, verses 9 and 10 O Lord, correct me, but with judgment, not in thine anger, lest thou bring me to nothing. Jeremiah 10, verse 24 Psalms 6, verse 1 Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. St. Matthew 3, verse 2 I will arise and go to my father, and will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee, and am no more worthy to be called thy son. St. Luke 15, verses 18 and 19 Enter not into judgment with thy servant, O Lord, for in thy sight shall no man living be justified. Psalms 143, verse 2 If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins, and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. 1 St. John 1, verses 8 and 9 Dearly beloved brethren, the scripture moveth us in sundry places to acknowledge and confess our manifold sins and wickedness, and that we should not dissemble nor cloak them before the face of Almighty God our Heavenly Father, but confess them with an humble, lowly, penitent and obedient heart, to the end that we may obtain forgiveness of the same by his infinite goodness and mercy. And although we ought at all times humbly to acknowledge our sins before God, yet ought we most chiefly so to do when we assemble and meet together to render thanks for the great benefits that we have received at his hands, to set forth his most worthy praise, to hear his most holy word, and to ask those things that are requisite and necessary as well for the body as for the soul. Wherefore, I pray and beseech you, as many as are here present, to accompany me with a pure heart and humble voice unto the throne of the heavenly grace, saying after me, a general confession to be said of the whole congregation, after the minister, all kneeling, Almighty and most merciful Father, we have erred and strayed from thy ways like lost sheep. We have followed too much the devices and desires of our own hearts. 
we have offended against thy holy laws. We have left undone those things which we ought to have done, and we have done those things which we ought not to have done, and there is no health in us. But thou, O Lord, have mercy upon us, miserable offenders. Spare thou them, O God, which confess their faults. Restore thou them that are penitent. According to thy promises declared unto mankind, in Christ Jesus our Lord. And grant, O most merciful Father, for his sake, that we may hereafter live a godly, righteous, and sober life, to the glory of thy holy name. Amen. The absolution or remission of sins to be pronounced by the priest alone standing, the people still kneeling. Almighty God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who desireth not the death of a sinner, but rather that he may turn from his wickedness and live, and has given power and commandment to his ministers to declare and pronounce to his people being penitent the absolution and remission of their sins. He pardoneth and absolveth all them that truly repent and unfeignedly believe his holy gospel. Wherefore let us beseech him to grant us true repentance and his Holy Spirit, that those things may please him which we do at this present, and that the rest of our life hereafter may be pure and holy, so that at the last we may come to his eternal joy, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Then the minister shall kneel and say the Lord's Prayer with an audible voice, the people also kneeling and repeating it with him, both here and wheresoever else it is used in divine service. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive them that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Then likewise he shall say, O Lord, open thou our lips. Answer, and our mouth shall show forth thy praise. Priest, O God, make speed to save us. Answer, O Lord, make haste to help us. Here, all standing up, the priest shall say, Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost. Answer, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Priest, praise ye the Lord. Answer, the Lord's name be praised. Then shall be said or sung the psalms in order as they be appointed. Then a lesson of the Old Testament as is appointed. And after that, Magnificat, or the Song of the Blessed Virgin Mary, in English, as followeth. Magnificat, St. Luke 1, verse 46. My soul doth magnify the Lord, and my spirit hath rejoiced in God my Saviour. For he hath regarded the lowliness of his handmaiden. For behold, from henceforth all generations shall call me blessed. For he that is mighty has magnified me, and holy is his name. And his mercy is on them that fear him throughout all generations. He has showed strength with his arm. He hath scattered the proud in the imagination of their hearts. He hath put down the mighty from their seat, and hath exalted the humble and meek. He hath filled the hungry with good things, and the rich he hath sent empty away. He, remembering of his mercy, hath holpen his servant Israel, as he promised to our forefathers, Abraham and his seed for ever. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Or else this psalm, except it be on the nineteenth day of the month, when it is read in the ordinary course of psalms. Cantate Domino, Psalm 98 
Sing unto the Lord a new song, for he has done marvellous things. With his own right hand and with his holy arm has he gotten himself the victory. The Lord declared his salvation. His righteousness has he openly showed in the sight of the nations. He hath remembered his mercy and truth towards the house of Israel, and all the ends of the world have seen the salvation of our God. Show yourselves joyful unto the Lord, all ye lands. Sing, rejoice, and give thanks. Praise the Lord upon the harp. Sing to the harp with a psalm of thanksgiving. With trumpets also and shawms, O oh, show yourselves joyful before the Lord, the King. Let the sea make a noise, and all that therein is, the round world and they that dwell within. Let the floods clap their hands, and let the hills be joyful together before the Lord, for he cometh to judge the earth. With righteousness shall he judge the world, and the peoples with equity. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Then a lesson of the New Testament, as it is appointed, and after that Nunc Dimittis, or the Song of Simeon, in English, as followeth. Nunc Dimittis, St. Luke 2, verse 29. Lord, now lettest thou thy servant depart in peace, according to thy word. For mine eyes have seen thy salvation, which thou hast prepared before the face of all peoples, to be a light to lighten the Gentiles, and the glory of thy people Israel. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Or else this psalm, except it be on the twelfth day of the month. Deus Miseritur, Psalm 67. God, be merciful unto us and bless us, and show us the light of his countenance, and be merciful unto us, that thy way may be known upon earth, thy saving health among all nations. Let the peoples praise thee, O God, yea, let all the peoples praise thee. Let the nations rejoice and be glad, for thou shalt judge the folk righteously, and govern the nations upon earth. Let the peoples praise thee, O God, yea, let all the peoples praise thee. Then shall the earth bring forth her increase, and God, even our own God, shall give us his blessing. God shall bless us, and all the ends of the world shall fear him. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Then shall be said or sung the Apostles' Creed, by the minister and the people standing. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered unto Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven, and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And after that, these prayers following, all devoutly kneeling, the minister first pronouncing with a loud voice, The Lord be with you. Answer, and with thy spirit. Minister, let us pray. Lord, have mercy upon us. Christ, have mercy upon us. Lord, have mercy upon us. Then the minister, clerks, and people shall say the Lord's Prayer with a loud voice. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. 
Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive them that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Then the priest, standing up, shall say, O Lord, show thy mercy upon us. Answer, and grant us thy salvation. Priest, O Lord, save the king. Answer, and mercifully hear us when we call upon thee. Priest, endue thy ministers with righteousness. Answer, and make thy chosen people joyful. Priest, O Lord, save thy people. Answer, and bless thine inheritance. Priest, give peace in our time, O Lord. Answer, because there is none other that fighteth for us, but only thou, O God. Priest, O God, make clean our hearts within us. Answer, and take not thy Holy Spirit from us. Then shall follow three collects, the first of the day, the second for peace, the third for aid against all perils, as hereafter followeth, which two last collects shall be said at evening prayer without alteration. The second collect at evening prayer. O God, from whom all holy desires, all good counsels, and all just works do proceed, Give unto thy servants that peace which the world cannot give, that our hearts may be set to obey thy commandments, and also that by thee, we being defended from the fear of our enemies, may pass our time in rest and quietness, through the merits of Jesus Christ our Saviour. Amen. The third collect for aid against all perils. Lighten our darkness, we beseech thee, O Lord and by thy great mercy defend us from all perils and dangers of this night. For the love of thy only Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. In choirs and places where they sing, here followeth the anthem. A prayer for the King's Majesty. O Lord, our Heavenly Father, high and mighty King of Kings, Lord of Lords, the only Ruler of Princes, who dost from thy throne behold all the dwellers upon earth. Most heartily we beseech thee with thy favour to behold our most gracious sovereign Lord King George, and so replenish him with the grace of thy Holy Spirit, that he may always incline to thy will and walk in thy way. Endue him plenteously with heavenly gifts, Grant him in health and wealth long to live. Strengthen him that he may vanquish and overcome all his enemies. And finally, after this life, he may attain everlasting joy and felicity. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. A prayer for the royal family. Almighty God, the fountain of all goodness, we humbly beseech thee to bless our gracious Queen Charlotte, her Royal Highness the Princess Dowager of Wales, and all the royal family. Endue them with thy Holy Spirit, enrich them with thy heavenly grace, prosper them with all happiness, and bring them to thine everlasting kingdom. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. A prayer for the clergy and people. Almighty and everlasting God, who alone workest great marvels, send down upon our bishops and curates and all congregations committed to their charge the healthful spirit of thy grace, that they may truly please thee. Pour upon them the continual dew of thy blessing. Grant this, O Lord, for the honour of our Advocate and Mediator, Jesus Christ. Amen. A prayer of St. Chrysostom. Almighty God, who has given us grace at this time with one accord to make our common supplications unto thee, and does promise that when two or three are gathered together in thy name, thou wilt grant their requests. Fulfil now, O Lord, 
the desires and petitions of thy servants as may be most expedient for them, granting us in this world knowledge of thy truth, and in the world to come life everlasting. Amen. 2 Corinthians verses 13 and 14 The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Ghost be with us all evermore. Amen. Here endeth the order of evening prayer throughout the year. End of the order for evening prayer. Prayers and Thanksgivings from the Book of Common Prayer, 1662. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Michael Maggs. Prayers and Thanksgivings upon several occasions to be used before the two final prayers of the litany, or of morning and evening prayer. Prayers For Rain O God, Heavenly Father, who by thy Son Jesus Christ hast promised to all them that seek thy kingdom, and the righteousness thereof, all things necessary to their bodily sustenance, send us, we beseech thee, in this our necessity, such moderate rain and showers, that we may receive the fruits of the earth to our comfort and to thy honour, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. For fair weather. O almighty Lord God, who for the sin of man didst once drown all the world except eight persons, and afterward of thy great mercy didst promise never to destroy it so again, we humbly beseech thee that although we for our iniquities have worthily deserved a plague of rain and waters, yet upon our true repentance thou wilt send us such weather as that we may receive the fruits of the earth in due season, and learn both by thy punishment to amend our lives, and for thy clemency to give thee praise and glory, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. In time of dearth and famine. O God, Heavenly Father, whose gift it is that the rain doth fall, that the earth is fruitful, beasts increase, and fishes do multiply, behold, we beseech thee, the afflictions of thy people, and grant that the scarcity and dearth, which we do now most justly suffer for our iniquity, may through thy goodness be mercifully turned into cheapness and plenty, for the love of Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom with thee and the Holy Ghost be all honour and glory, now and for ever. Amen. All this, O God, merciful Father, who in the time of Elisha the prophet didst suddenly in Samaria turn great scarcity and dearth into plenty and cheapness, have mercy upon us that we, who are now for our sins punished with like adversity, may likewise find a seasonable relief. Increase the fruits of the earth by thy heavenly benediction, and grant that we, receiving thy bountiful liberality, may use the same to thy glory, the relief of those that are needy, and our own comfort, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. In the time of war and tumults, O Almighty God, King of all kings and Governor of all things, whose power no creature is able to resist, to whom it belongeth justly to punish sinners and to be merciful to them that truly repent, save and deliver us, we humbly beseech thee, from the hands of our enemies, abate their pride, assuage their malice and confound their devices, that we, being armed with thy defence, may be preserved evermore from all perils to glorify thee, who art the only giver of all victory, through the merits of thy Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. In the time of any common plague or sickness, O Almighty God, who in thy wrath did send a plague upon thine own people in the wilderness for their obstinate rebellion against Moses and Aaron, and also in the time of King David didst slay with the plague of pestilence three score and ten thousand, and yet, remembering thy mercy, didst save the rest. Have mercy upon us, miserable sinners, 
who now are visited with great sickness and mortality, that like as thou didst then accept of an atonement, and didst command the destroying angel to cease from punishing, so it may now please thee to withdraw from us this plague and grievous sickness, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. In the ember weeks, to be said every day for those that are about to be admitted into holy orders. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who hast purchased to thyself an universal church by the precious blood of thy dear Son, mercifully look upon the same, and at this time so guide and govern the minds of thy servants, the bishops and pastors of thy flock, that they may lay hands suddenly on no man, but faithfully and wisely make choice of fit persons to serve in the sacred ministry of thy church, and those which shall be ordained to any holy function give thy grace and heavenly benediction, that both by their life and doctrine they may set forth thy glory, and set forward the salvation of all men, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. All this, Almighty God, the giver of all good gifts, who of thy divine providence hast appointed diverse orders in thy church, give thy grace, we humbly beseech thee, to all those who are to be called to any office and administration in the same, and so replenish them with the truth of thy doctrine, and endue them with innocency of life, that they may faithfully serve before thee, to the glory of thy great name and the benefit of thy holy church, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. A prayer for the High Court of Parliament to be read during their session. Most gracious God, we humbly beseech thee, as for this kingdom in general, so especially for the High Court of Parliament, under our most religious and gracious King at this time assembled, that thou wouldest be pleased to direct and prosper all their consultations to the advancement of thy glory, the good of thy church, the safety, honour and welfare of our sovereign and his kingdoms, that all things may be so ordered and settled by their endeavours upon the best and surest foundations, that peace and happiness, truth and justice, religion and piety may be established among us for all generations. These and all other necessities for them, for us, and thy whole church, we humbly beg in the name and mediation of Jesus Christ, our most blessed Lord and Saviour. Amen. A collect or prayer for all conditions of men to be used at such times when the litany is not appointed to be said. O God, the Creator and Preserver of all mankind, we humbly beseech thee for all sorts and conditions of men, that thou wouldest be pleased to make thy ways known unto them, thy saving health unto all nations. More especially, we pray for the good estate of the Catholic Church, that it may be so guided and governed by thy good spirit, that all who profess and call themselves Christians may be led into the way of truth, and hold the faith in unity of spirit, in the bond of peace, and in righteousness of life. Finally, we commend to thy fatherly goodness all those who are in any ways afflicted or distressed, in mind, body, or estate. Asterisk, this to be said when any desired the prayers of the congregation, especially those for whom our prayers are desired, that it may please thee to comfort and relieve them according to their several necessities, giving them patience under their sufferings, and a happy issue out of all their afflictions. And this we beg for Jesus Christ, his sake. Amen. A prayer that may be said after any of the former. O God, whose nature and property is ever to have mercy and to forgive, receive our humble petitions. And though we be tied and bound with the chains of our sins, yet let the pitifulness of thy great mercy loose us. For the honour of Jesus Christ, our Mediator and Advocate. Amen. Thanksgivings A general thanksgiving. Almighty God, Father of all mercies, 
we, thine unworthy servants, to give thee most humble and hearty thanks for all thy goodness and loving kindness to us and to all men. Asterisk, this to be said when any that have been prayed for desire to return praise, particularly to those who desire now to offer up their praises and thanksgivings for any late mercies vouchsafed unto them. We bless thee for our creation, preservation, and all the blessings of this life, but above all for thine inestimable love in the redemption of the world by our Lord Jesus Christ, for the means of grace and for the hope of glory. And we beseech thee, give us that due sense of all thy mercies that our hearts may be unfeignedly thankful, and that we may show forth thy praise, not only with our lips but in our lives, by giving up ourselves to thy service, and by walking before thee in holiness and righteousness all our days. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom with thee and the Holy Ghost be all honour and glory, world without end. Amen. For rain, O God, our Heavenly Father, who by thy gracious providence doth cause the former and the latter rain to descend upon the earth, that it may bring forth fruit for the use of man, we give thee humble thanks that it hath pleased thee in our great necessity to send us at the last a joyful rain upon thine inheritance, and to refresh it when it was dry, to the great comfort of us thy unworthy servants, and to the glory of thy holy name. Through thy mercies, in Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. For fair weather, O Lord God, who hast justly humbled us by thy late plague of immoderate rain and waters, and in thy mercy hast relieved and comforted our souls by this seasonable and blessed change of weather, we praise and glorify thy holy name for this mercy, and will always declare thy loving kindness from generation to generation, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. For plenty. O most merciful Father, who of thy gracious goodness hast heard the devout prayers of thy church, and turned our dearth and scarcity into cheapness and plenty, we give thee humble thanks for this thy special bounty, beseeching thee to continue thy loving kindness unto us, that our land may yield us her fruits of increase to thy glory and our comfort. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen for peace and deliverance from our enemies. O Almighty God, who art a strong tower of defence unto thy servants against the face of their enemies, we yield thee praise and thanksgiving for our deliverance from those great and apparent dangers wherewith we were compassed. We acknowledge it thy goodness that we were not delivered over as a prey unto them, beseeching thee still to continue such thy mercies towards us, that all the world may know that Thou art our Saviour and mighty Deliverer, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. For restoring public peace at home. O Eternal God, our Heavenly Father, who alone makest men to be of one mind in a house, and stillest the outrage of a violent and unruly people, we bless Thy holy name, that it has pleased thee to appease the seditious tumults which have lately been raised up amongst us, most humbly beseeching thee to grant to all of us grace, that we may henceforth obediently walk in thy holy commandments, and leading a quiet and peaceable life in all goodliness and honesty, may continually offer unto thee our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving for these thy mercies towards us, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. For deliverance from the plague or other common sickness. O Lord God, who has wounded us for our sins and consumed us for our transgressions by thy late heavy and dreadful visitation, and now in the midst of judgment remembering mercy hast redeemed our souls from the jaws of death, we offer unto thy fatherly goodness ourselves our souls and bodies which thou hast delivered to be a living sacrifice unto thee, 
always praising and magnifying thy mercies in the midst of thy church. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. All this we humbly acknowledge before thee, O most merciful Father, that all the punishments which are threatened in thy law might justly have fallen upon us by reason of our manifold transgressions and hardness of heart. Yet, seeing it hath pleased thee of thy tender mercy upon our weak and unworthy humiliation, to assuage the contagious sickness wherewith we lately have been sore afflicted, and to restore the voice of joy and health into our dwellings, we offer unto thy divine majesty the sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, lauding and magnifying thy preservation and providence over us. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. End of Prayers and Thanksgivings Holy Communion from the Book of Common Prayer, 1662. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Michael Maggs. The Order for the Administration of the Lord's Supper, or Holy Communion. So many as intend to be partakers of the communion shall signify their names to the curate at least some time the day before. And if any of those be an open and notorious evil liver, or have done any wrong to his neighbours by word or deed, so that the congregation be hereby offended, the curate, having knowledge thereof, shall call him and advertise him, that in any wise he presume not to come to the Lord's table, until he hath openly declared himself to have truly repented and amended his former naughty life, that the congregation may thereby be satisfied which before were offended, and that he hath recompensed the parties to whom he hath done wrong, or at least declare himself to be in full purpose so to do, as soon as he conveniently may. The same order shall the curate use with those betwixt whom he perceiveth malice and hatred to reign, not suffering them to be partakers of the Lord's table until he know them to be reconciled. And if one of the parties, so at variance, be content to forgive from the bottom of his heart all that the other hath trespassed against him, and to make amends for that he himself hath offended, and the other party will not be persuaded to a godly unity, but remain still in his frowardness and malice, the minister in that case ought to admit the penitent person to the Holy Communion, and not him that is obstinate, provided that every minister so repelling any, as is specified in this or the next precedent paragraph of this rubric, shall be obliged to give an account of the same to the ordinary, within fourteen days after, at the farthest, and the ordinary shall proceed against the offending person according to the canon. The table at the communion time, having a fair white linen cloth upon it, shall stand in the body of the church, or in the chancel, where morning and evening prayer are appointed to be said. And the priest, standing at the north side of the table, shall say the Lord's Prayer with the collect following, the people kneeling. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive them that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. The Collect Almighty God, unto whom all hearts be open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of thy Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love thee and worthily magnify thy holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Then shall the minister, turning to the people, rehearse distinctly all the Ten Commandments, and the people, still kneeling, shall, after each commandment, ask God mercy for their transgressions thereof for the time past, and grace to keep the same for the time to come, as followeth. Minister, God spake these words and said, 
I am the Lord thy God. Thou shalt have none other gods but me. People, Lord, have mercy upon us, and incline our hearts to keep this law. Minister, thou shalt not make to thyself any graven image, nor the likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or in the earth beneath, or in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down to them, nor worship them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, and visit the sins of the fathers upon the children, upon the third and fourth generation of them that hate me, and show mercy unto thousands in them that love me and keep my commandments. People, Lord, have mercy on us, and incline our hearts to keep this law. Minister, thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. People, Lord, have mercy upon us, and incline our hearts to keep this law. Minister, remember that thou keep holy the Sabbath day. Six days shalt thou labour, and do all that thou hast to do. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt do no manner of work, thou and thy son and thy daughter, thy manservant and thy maidservant, thy cattle and the stranger that is within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the seventh day, and hallowed it. People, Lord, have mercy upon us, and incline our hearts to keep this law. Minister, honour thy father and thy mother, that thy days may be long in the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. People, Lord, have mercy upon us, and incline our hearts to keep this law. Minister, thou shalt do no murder. People, Lord, have mercy upon us, and incline our hearts to keep this law. Minister, thou shalt not commit adultery. People, Lord, have mercy upon us, and incline our hearts to keep this law. Minister, thou shalt not steal. People, Lord, have mercy upon us, and incline our hearts to keep this law. Minister, thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbour. People, Lord, have mercy upon us, and incline our hearts to keep this law. Minister, thou shalt not covet thy neighbour's house. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbour's wife, nor his servant, nor his maid, nor his ox, nor his ass, nor anything that is his. People, Lord, have mercy upon us, and write these thy laws in our hearts, we beseech thee. Then shall follow one of these two collects for the king, the priest standing as before, and saying, Let us pray. Almighty God, whose kingdom is everlasting and power infinite, have mercy upon the whole church, and so rule the heart of thy chosen servant, George, our king and governor, that he, knowing whose minister he is, may above all things seek thy honour and glory, and that we and all his subjects, duly considering whose authority he has, may faithfully serve, honour and humbly obey him, in thee and for thee, according to thy blessed word and ordinance, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who with thee and the Holy Ghost liveth and reigneth, ever one God, world without end. Amen. Or, Almighty and everlasting God, we are taught by thy holy word that the hearts of kings are in thy rule and governance, and that thou dost dispose and turn them as it seemeth best to thy godly wisdom, we humbly beseech thee so to dispose and govern the heart of George, thy servant, our king and governor, that in all his thoughts, words and works he may seek thy honour and glory, and study to preserve thy people committed to his charge in wealth, peace and godliness. Grant this, O most merciful Father, for thy dear Son's sake, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Then shall be said the collect of the day, and immediately after the collect the minister shall read the epistle, saying, The epistle, or 
the portion of scripture appointed for the epistle, is written in the blank chapter of blank, beginning at the blank verse. And the epistle ended, he shall say, Here endeth the epistle. Then shall he read the gospel, the people all standing up, saying, The holy gospel is written in the blank chapter of blank, beginning at the blank verse. And the gospel ended shall be sung or said the creed following, the people still standing as before. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven, and was incarnate by the Holy Ghost of the Virgin Mary, and was made man, and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again according to the Scriptures, and ascendeth into heaven, and sitteth on the right hand of the Father. And he shall come again with glory to judge both the quick and the dead, whose kingdom shall have no end. And I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Lord and giver of life, who proceedeth from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spake by the prophets, and I believe one holy Catholic and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Then the curate shall declare unto the people what holy days or fasting days are in the week following to be observed. And then also, if occasion be, shall notice be given of the communion and the bands of matrimony published, and briefs, citations, and excommunications read. And nothing shall be proclaimed or published in the church during the time of divine service but by the minister, nor by him anything but what is prescribed in the rules of this book, or enjoined by the king, or by the ordinary of the place. Then shall follow the sermon, or one of the homilies set forth, or hereafter to be set forth, by authority. Then shall the priest return to the Lord's table and begin the offertory, saying one or more of these sentences following, as he thinketh most convenient in his discretion. Let your light so shine before men, that they may see your good works, and glorify your Father which is in heaven. St. Matthew 5, verse 16. Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. St. Matthew 6, verses 19 and 20. Whatsoever ye would do that men should do to you, even so do unto them, for this is the law and the prophets. St. Matthew 7, verse 12. Not every one that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. St. Matthew 7, verse 21. Zacchaeus stood forth and said unto the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give unto the poor, and if I have done any wrong to any man, I restore fourfold. St. Luke 19, verse 8. Who goeth a warfare at any time of his own cost? Who planteth a vineyard, and eateth not of the fruit thereof? Or who feedeth a flock, and eateth not of the milk of the flock? 1 Corinthians 9, verse 7. If we have sown unto you spiritual things, is it a great matter if we shall reap your worldly things? 1 Corinthians 9, verse 11. 
Do ye not know that they who minister about holy things live of the sacrifice, and they who wait at the altar are partakers with the altar? Even so hath the Lord also ordained that they who preach the gospel should live of the gospel. 1 Corinthians 9, verses 13 and 14. He that soweth little shall reap little, and he that soweth plenteously shall reap plenteously. Let every man do according as he is disposed in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. 2 Corinthians 9, verses 6 and 7. Let him that is taught in the word minister unto him that teacheth in all good things. Be not deceived, God is not mocked, for whatever a man soweth, that shall he reap. Galatians 6, verses 6 and 7. While we have time, let us do good unto all men, and specially unto them that are of the household of faith. Galatians 6, verse 10. Godliness is great riches if a man be content with that he hath. For we brought nothing into the world, neither may we carry anything out. 1 Timothy 6, verses 6 and 7. Charge them who are rich in this world, that they be ready to give and glad to distribute, laying up store for themselves a good foundation against the time to come, that they may attain eternal life. 1 Timothy 6, verses 17, 18, 19. God is not unrighteous that he will forget your works and labour that proceedeth of love, which love ye hath showed for his name's sake, who have ministered to the saints, and yet do minister. Hebrews 6, verse 10. To do good and to distribute, forget not, for with such sacrifices God is pleased. Hebrews 13, verse 16. Whoso hath this world's good, and seeth his brother have need, and shutteth up his compassion from him, how dwelleth the love of God in him? 1 St. John 3, verse 17. Give alms of thy goods, and never turn thy face from any poor man, and then the face of the Lord shall not be turned away from thee. Tobias 4, verse 7. Be merciful after thy power. If thou hast much, Give plenteously. If thou hast little, do thy diligence gladly to give of that little. For so gatherest thou thyself a good reward in the day of necessity. Tobias 4, verses 8 and 9. He that hath pity upon the poor lendeth unto the Lord. And look, what he layeth out, it shall be paid him again. Proverbs 19, verse 17. Blessed be the man that provideth for the sick and needy. The Lord shall deliver him in the time of trouble. Psalms 41, verse 1. When these sentences are in reading, the deacons, church wardens, or other fit persons appointed for that purpose shall receive the alms for the poor and other devotions of the people in a decent basin to be provided by the parish for that purpose and reverently bring it to the priest, who shall humbly present and place it upon the holy table. And when there is a communion, the priest shall then place upon the table so much bread and wine as he shall think sufficient. After which done, the priest shall say, Let us pray for the whole state of Christ's church militant here in earth. Almighty and everlasting God, who by thy holy apostle has taught us to make prayers and supplications and to give thanks for all men. We humbly beseech thee most mercifully to accept our alms and oblations. Asterisk. If there be no alms or oblations, then shall the words to accept our alms and oblations be left out unsaid. And to receive these our prayers, which we offer unto thy divine majesty, beseeching thee to inspire continually the universal church with the spirit of truth, unity, and concord. And grant that all they that do confess thy holy name may agree in the truth of thy holy word, 
and live in unity and godly love, we beseech thee also to save and defend all Christian kings, princes and governors, and especially thy servant George, our King, that under him we may be godly and quietly governed, and grant unto his whole counsel and to all that are put in authority under him that they may truly and indifferently minister justice to the punishment of wickedness and vice, and to the maintenance of thy true religion and virtue. Give grace, O Heavenly Father, to all bishops and curates, that they may both by their life and doctrine set forth thy true and lively word, and rightly and duly administer thy holy sacraments. And to all thy people give thy heavenly grace, and especially to this congregation here present, that, with meek heart and due reverence, they may hear and receive thy holy word, truly serving thee in holiness and righteousness all the days of their life. And we most humbly beseech thee of thy goodness, O Lord, to comfort and succour all of them who in this transitory life are in trouble, sorrow, need, sickness, or any other adversity. And we also bless thy holy name, for all thy servants departed this life in thy faith and fear, beseeching thee to give us grace so to follow their good examples, that with them we may be partakers of thy heavenly kingdom. Grant this, O Father, for Jesus Christ's sake, our only mediator and advocate. Amen. When the minister giveth warning for the celebration of the Holy Communion, which he shall always do upon the Sunday or some holy day immediately preceding, after the sermon or homily ended, he shall read this exhortation following. Dearly beloved, on blank day next, I purpose, through God's assistance, to administer to all such as shall be religiously and devoutly disposed the most comfortable sacrament of the body and blood of Christ, to be by them received in remembrance of his meritorious cross and passion, whereby alone we obtain remission of our sins, and are made partakers of the kingdom of heaven. Wherefore it is our duty to render most humble and hearty thanks to Almighty God our Heavenly Father, for that he has given his Son, our Saviour Jesus Christ, not only to die for us, but also to be our spiritual food and sustenance in that holy sacrament, which, being so divine and comfortable a thing to them who receive it worthily, and so dangerous to them that will presume to receive it unworthily, my duty is to exhort you in the mean season to consider the dignity of that holy mystery, and the great peril of the unworthy receiving thereof, and so to search and examine your own consciences, and that not lightly, and after the manner of dissemblers with God, so that ye may come holy and clean to such a heavenly feast, in the marriage garment required by God in holy scripture, and be received as worthy partakers of that holy table. The way and means thereto is... First, to examine your lives and conversations by the rule of God's commandments, and wheresoever ye shall perceive yourselves to have offended, either by will, word, or deed, there to bewail your own sinfulness, and to confess yourselves to Almighty God with full purpose of amendment of life. And if ye shall perceive your offences to be such as are not only against God, but also against your neighbours, then ye shall reconcile yourselves unto them, being ready to make restitution and satisfaction according to the utmost of your powers for all injuries and wrongs done by you to any other, and being likewise ready to forgive others who have offended you as you would have forgiveness of your offences at God's hand. For otherwise, the receiving of the Holy Communion doth nothing else but increase your damnation. Therefore, if any of you be a blasphemer of God, an hinderer or slanderer of his word, 
an adulterer, or be in malice or envy, or in any other grievous crime, repent you of your sins, or else come not to that holy table, lest, after taking of that holy sacrament, the devil enter into you as he entered into Judas, and fill you full of all iniquities, and bring you to destruction, both of body and soul. And because it is requisite that no man should come to the Holy Communion but with a full trust in God's mercy, and with a quiet conscience, therefore, if there be any of you who by this means cannot quiet his own conscience herein, but requireth further comfort or counsel, let him come to me, or to some other discreet and learned minister of God's word, and open his grief, that by the ministry of God's holy word he may receive the benefit of absolution, together with ghostly counsel and advice, to the quieting of his conscience and avoiding of all scruple and doubtfulness. Or, in case he shall see the people negligent to come to the Holy Communion, instead of the former, he may use this exhortation. Dearly beloved brethren, on blank, I intend by God's grace to celebrate the Lord's Supper, unto which, in God's behalf, I bid you all that are here present, and beseech you for the Lord Jesus Christ's sake, that ye will not refuse to come thereto, being so lovingly called and bidden by God himself. Ye know how grievous and unkind a thing it is, when a man hath prepared a rich feast, decked his table with all kind of provision, so that there lacketh nothing but the guests to sit down, and yet they who are called, without any cause, most unthankfully refuse to come. Which of you, in such a case, would not be moved? Who would not think it a great injury and wrong done unto him? Wherefore, most dearly beloved in Christ, take ye good heed, lest ye, withdrawing yourselves from this holy supper, provoke God's indignation against you. It is an easy matter for a man to say, I will not communicate, because I am otherwise hindered with worldly business. But such excuses are not so easily accepted and allowed before God. If any man say, I am a grievous sinner, and therefore I am afraid to come, Wherefore then do ye not repent and amend? When God calleth you, are ye not ashamed to say ye will not come? When ye should return to God, will ye excuse yourselves, and say ye are not ready? Consider earnestly with yourselves how little such feigned excuses will avail before God. They that refuse the feast in the gospel because they had bought a farm, or would try their yokes of oxen, or because they were married, were not so excused, but counted unworthy of the heavenly feast. I, for my part, shall be ready, and, according to mine office, I bid you in the name of God. I call you in Christ's behalf. I exhort you, as ye love your own salvation, that ye will be partakers of this holy communion. And as the Son of God did vouchsafe to yield up his soul by death upon the cross for your salvation, so it is your duty to receive the communion in remembrance of the sacrifice of his death, as he himself has commanded. Which, if ye shall neglect to do, consider with yourselves how great injury ye do unto God, and how sore punishment hangeth over your heads for the same, when ye wilfully abstain from the Lord's table, and separate from your brethren who come to feed on the banquet of that most heavenly food. These things, if ye earnestly consider, ye will by God's grace return to a better mind, for the obtaining whereof we shall not cease to make our humble petitions unto Almighty God, our Heavenly Father. At the time of the celebration of the Communion, the communicants being conveniently placed for the receiving of the Holy Sacrament, the priest shall say this exhortation. Dearly beloved in the Lord, ye that mind to come to the Holy Communion of the body and blood of our Saviour Jesus Christ, 
must consider how St. Paul exhorteth all persons diligently to try and examine themselves before they presume to eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For, as the benefit is great, if, with a true penitent heart and lively face, we receive that holy sacrament, for then we spiritually eat the flesh of Christ and spiritually drink his blood, then we dwell in Christ and Christ in us. We are one with Christ and Christ with us. So is the danger great if we receive the same unworthily. For then we are guilty of the body and blood of Christ our Saviour. We eat and drink our own damnation, not considering the Lord's body. We kindle God's wrath against us. We provoke him to plague us with diverse diseases and sundry kinds of death. Judge therefore yourselves, brethren, that ye be not judged of the Lord. Repent you truly for your sins past. Have a lively and steadfast faith in Christ our Saviour. Amend your lives, and be in perfect charity with all men. So shall ye be meet partakers of those holy mysteries. And above all things ye must give most humble and hearty thanks to God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, for the redemption of the world by the death and passion of our Saviour Jesus Christ, both God and man, who did humble himself even to the death upon the cross for us miserable sinners, who lay in darkness and the shadow of death, that he might make us the children of God and exalt us to everlasting life. And to the end that we should always remember the exceeding great love of our Master and only Saviour, Jesus Christ, thus dying for us, and the innumerable benefits which by his precious bloodshedding he hath obtained to us, he has instituted and ordained holy mysteries as pledges of his love, and for a continual remembrance of his death to our great and endless comfort. To him, therefore, with the Father and the Holy Ghost, let us give, as we are most bounden, continual thanks, submitting ourselves wholly to his holy will and pleasure, and studying to serve him in true holiness and righteousness all the days of our life. Amen. Then shall the priest say to them that come to receive the Holy Communion, Ye that do truly and earnestly repent you of your sins, and are in love and charity with your neighbours, and intend to lead a new life following the commandments of God, and walking from henceforth in his holy ways, draw near with faith, and take this holy sacrament to your comfort, and make your humble confession to Almighty God, meekly kneeling upon your knees, then shall this general confession be made in the name of all those that are minded to receive the Holy Communion by one of the ministers, both he and all the people kneeling humbly upon their knees and saying, Almighty God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, Maker of all things, Judge of all men, we acknowledge and bewail our manifold sins and wickedness, which we from time to time most grievously have committed, by thought, word, and deed, against thy divine majesty, provoking most justly thy wrath and indignation against us. We do earnestly repent, and are heartily sorry for these our misdoings. The remembrance of them is grievous unto us, the burden of them is intolerable. Have mercy upon us, have mercy upon us, most merciful Father. For thy Son, our Lord Jesus Christ's sake, forgive us all that is past, and grant that we may hereafter serve thee and please thee in newness of life, to the honour and glory of thy name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Then shall the priest, or bishop being present, stand up, and, turning himself to the people, pronounce this absolution. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, 
who of his great mercy hath promised forgiveness of sins to all them that with hearty repentance and true faith turn unto him, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and bring you to eternal life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Then shall the priest say, Hear what comfortable words our Saviour Christ saith unto all that truly turn to him. Come unto me, all that travail and are heavy laden, and I will refresh you. St. Matthew 11, verse 28. So God loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, to the end that all that believe in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. St. John 3, verse 16. Hear also what St. Paul saith. This is a true saying, and worthy of all men to be received, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. 1 Timothy 1 verse 15 Hear also what St. John saith. If any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, and he is the propitiation for our sins. 1 St. John 2, verse 1. After which the priest shall proceed, saying, Lift up your hearts. Answer, we lift them up unto the Lord. Priest, let us give thanks unto the Lord our God. Answer, it is meet and right so to do. Then shall the priest turn to the Lord's table and say, It is very meet, right, and our bounden duty that we should at all times and in all places give thanks unto thee, O Lord. Holy Father, asterisk, these words, Holy Father, must be omitted on Trinity Sunday. Almighty, everlasting God, here shall follow the proper preface according to the time, if there be any specially appointed, or else immediately shall follow. Therefore, with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify thy glorious name, evermore praising thee, and saying, Holy, 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 Lord God of hosts, heaven and earth are full of thy glory. Glory be to Thee, O Lord Most High. Amen. Proper Prefaces Upon Christmas Day and seven days after, because Thou didst give Jesus Christ, Thine only Son, to be born as at this time for us, who, by the operation of the Holy Ghost, was made very man of the substance of the Virgin Mary his mother, and that without spot of sin, to make us clean from all sin. Therefore with angels, etc. Upon Easter day and seven days after. But chiefly are we bound to praise thee for the glorious resurrection of thy Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. For he is the very paschal lamb which was offered for us, and hath taken away the sin of the world, who by his death hath destroyed death, and by his rising to life again hath restored to us everlasting life. Therefore with angels, etc. Upon Ascension Day and seven days after, through thy most dearly beloved Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who after his most glorious resurrection manifestly appeared to all his apostles, and in their sight ascended up into heaven to prepare a place for us, that where he is, thither we might also ascend and reign with him in glory, therefore with angels, etc. Upon Whit Sunday and six days after, through Jesus Christ our Lord, according to whose most true promise the Holy Ghost came down as at this time from heaven with a sudden great sound, as it had been a mighty wind, in the likeness of fiery tongues, lighting upon the apostles to teach them and to lead them to all truth, giving them both the gift of diverse languages and also boldness with fervent zeal constantly to preach the gospel to all nations, whereby we have been brought out of darkness and error 
into the clear light and true knowledge of thee and of thy Son, Jesus Christ. Therefore, with angels, etc. Upon the feast of Trinity only, who art one God, one Lord, not only one person, but three persons in one substance, for that which we believe of the glory of the Father, the same we believe of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, without any difference or inequality, therefore with angels, etc. After each of which prefaces shall immediately be sung or said, Therefore, with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify thy holy name, evermore praising thee and saying, Holy, 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 Lord God of hosts, heaven and earth are full of thy glory. Glory be to thee, O Lord Most High. Amen. Then shall the priest, kneeling down at the Lord's table, say in the name of all them that shall receive the communion this prayer following. We do not presume to come to this thy table, merciful Lord, trusting in our own righteousness, but in thy manifold and great mercies. We are not worthy so much as to gather up the crumbs under thy table. But thou art the same Lord, whose property is always to have mercy. Grant us, therefore, gracious Lord, so to eat the flesh of thy dear Son Jesus Christ, and to drink his blood, that our sinful bodies may be made clean by his body, and our souls washed through his most precious blood, and that we may evermore dwell in him, and he in us. Amen. When the priest, standing before the table, hath so ordered the bread and wine, that he may with the more readiness and decency break the bread before the people, and take the cup into his hands, he shall say the prayer of consecration as followeth. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who of thy tender mercy didst give thine only Son, Jesus Christ, to suffer death on the cross for our redemption, who made there, by his one oblation of himself once offered, a full, perfect and sufficient sacrifice, oblation and satisfaction for the sins of the whole world, and did institute and in his holy gospel command us to continue a perpetual memory of that his precious death until his coming again. Hear us, O merciful Father, we most humbly beseech thee, and grant that we, receiving these thy creatures of bread and wine, according to thy Son, our Saviour Jesus Christ's holy institution, in remembrance of his death and passion, may be partakers of his most blessed body and blood, who, in the same night that he was betrayed, took bread. Note, here the priest is to take the pattern into his hands. And when he had given thanks, he brake it. Note, and here to break the bread. And gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Note, and here to lay his hand upon all the bread. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise after supper, he took the cup, Note, here he is to take the cup into his hand. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of this, for this is my blood of the New Testament. Note, and here to lay his hand upon every vessel, be it chalice or flagon, in which there is any wine to be consecrated, which is shed for you and for many for the remission of sins. Do this as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. Amen. Then shall the minister first receive the communion in both kinds himself, and then proceed to deliver the same to the bishops, priests, and deacons in like manner, if any be present, and after that to the people also in order into their hands, all meekly kneeling. And when he delivereth the bread to any one, he shall say, 
the body of our Lord Jesus Christ, which was given for thee, preserve thy body and soul unto everlasting life. Take and eat this in remembrance that Christ died for thee, and feed on him in thy heart by faith with thanksgiving. And the minister that delivereth the cup shall say, The blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, which was shed for thee, preserve thy body and soul unto everlasting life. Drink this in remembrance that Christ's blood was shed for thee, and be thankful. If the consecrated bread or wine be all spent before all have communicated, the priest is to consecrate more according to the form before prescribed, beginning at Our Saviour Christ in the same night, etc., for the blessing of the bread, and at Likewise after supper, etc., for the blessing of the cup. When all have communicated, the minister shall return to the Lord's table and reverently place upon it what remaineth of the consecrated elements, covering the same with a fair linen cloth. Then shall the priest say the Lord's Prayer, the people repeating after him every petition. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive them that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. After shall be said as followeth. O Lord and Heavenly Father, we, thy humble servants, entirely desire thy fatherly goodness mercifully to accept this our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, most humbly beseeching thee to grant that by thy merits and death of thy Son Jesus Christ, and through faith in his blood, we and all thy whole church may obtain remission of our sins and all other benefits of his passion. And here we offer and present unto thee, O Lord, ourselves, our souls and bodies, to be a reasonable, holy, and lively sacrifice unto thee, humbly beseeching thee that all we who are partakers of this holy communion may be fulfilled with thy grace and heavenly benediction. And although we be unworthy through our manifold sins to offer unto thee any sacrifice, yet we beseech thee to accept this our bounden duty and service, not weighing our merits, but pardoning our offences. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, by whom and with whom in the unity of the Holy Ghost all honour and glory be unto thee, O Father Almighty, world without end. Amen. All this. Almighty and everlasting God, we most heartily thank thee for that thou dost vouchsafe to feed us who have duly received these holy mysteries with the spiritual food of the most precious body and blood of thy Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ, and doth assure us thereby of thy favour and goodness towards us, and that we are very members incorporate in the mystical body of thy Son, which is the blessed company of all faithful people and are also heirs through hope of thy everlasting kingdom by the merits of the most precious death and passion of thy dear Son. And we most humbly beseech thee, O Heavenly Father, so to assist us with thy grace, that we may continue in that holy fellowship and do all such good works as thou hast prepared for us to walk in, through Jesus Christ our Lord to whom with thee and the Holy Ghost be all honour and glory, world without end. Amen. Then shall be said or sung, Glory be to God on high, and in earth peace, good will towards men. We praise thee, we bless thee, we worship thee, we glorify thee, we give thanks to thee for thy great glory, O Lord God, heavenly King, God the Father Almighty. O Lord, the only begotten Son, Jesu Christ, O Lord God, Lamb of God, Son of the Father, that takest away the sins of the world, have mercy upon us. Thou that takest away the sins of the world, have mercy upon us. 
Thou that takest away the sins of the world, receive our prayer. Thou that sittest at the right hand of God the Father, have mercy upon us. For Thou only art holy, Thou only art the Lord. Thou only, O Christ, with the Holy Ghost, art most high in the glory of God the Father. Amen. Then the priest, or bishop if he be present, shall let them depart with this blessing. The peace of God, which passeth all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son Jesus Christ our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, be amongst you and remain with you always. Amen. Collects to be said after the offertory when there is no communion, every such day one or more. And the same may be said also, as often as occasion shall serve, after the collects either of morning or evening prayer, communion or litany, by the discretion of the minister. Assist us mercifully, O Lord, in these our supplications and prayers, and dispose the way of thy servants towards the attainment of everlasting salvation, that among all the changes and chances of this mortal life they may ever be defended by thy most gracious and ready help. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty Lord and everlasting God, vouchsafe we beseech thee to direct, sanctify, and govern both our hearts and bodies in the ways of thy laws and in the works of thy commandments, that through thy most mighty protection, both here and ever, we may be preserved in body and soul through our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Grant, we beseech thee, Almighty God, that the words which we have heard this day with our outward ears may through thy grace be so grafted inwardly in our hearts that they may bring forth in us the fruit of thy good living, to the honour and praise of thy name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Prevent us, O Lord, in all our doings with thy most gracious favour, and further us with thy continual help that in all our works begun, continued, and ended in thee, we may glorify thy holy name, and finally by thy mercy obtain everlasting life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, the fountain of all wisdom, who knowest our necessities before we ask, and our ignorance in asking, we beseech thee to have compassion upon our infirmities, and those things which for our unworthiness we dare not, and for our blindness we cannot ask, vouchsafe to give us, for the worthiness of thy Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, who hath promised to hear the petitions of them that ask in thy Son's name, we beseech thee mercifully to incline thine ears to us that have made now our prayers and supplications unto thee and grant that those things which we have faithfully asked according to thy will may effectually be obtained to the relief of our necessity and to the setting forth of thy glory. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Upon the Sundays and other holy days, if there be no communion, shall be said all that is appointed at the communion until the end of the general prayer, for the whole state of Christ's church militant here in earth, together with one or more of these collects last before rehearsed, concluding with the blessing. And there shall be no celebration of the Lord's Supper, except there be a convenient number to communicate with the priest, according to his discretion. And if there be not above twenty persons in the parish of discretion to receive the communion, Yet there shall be no communion except four, or three at the least, communicate with the priest. And in cathedrals and collegiate churches and colleges, where there are many priests and deacons, they shall all receive the communion with the priest every Sunday at the least, except they have a reasonable cause to the contrary. And to take away all occasion of dissension and superstition 
which any person hath or might have concerning the bread and wine, it shall suffice that the bread be such as is usual to be eaten, but the best and purest wheat bread that conveniently may be gotten. And if any of the bread and wine remain unconsecrated, the curate shall have it to his own use. But if any remain of that which was consecrated, it shall not be carried out of the church, but the priest and such other of the communicants as he shall then call to him shall, immediately after the blessing, reverently eat and drink the same. The bread and wine for the communion shall be provided by the curate and the church wardens at the charge of the parish. And note that every parishioner shall communicate at the least three times in the year, of which Easter to be one. And yearly at Easter, every parishioner shall reckon with the parson, vicar, or curate, or his or their deputy or deputies, and pay to them or him all ecclesiastical duties, accustomably due, then and at that time to be paid. After the divine service ended, the money given at the offertory shall be disposed of to such pious and charitable uses as the minister and church wardens shall think fit, wherein, if they disagree, it shall be disposed of as the ordinary shall appoint. Whereas it is ordained in this office for the administration of the Lord's Supper that the communicants should receive the same kneeling, which order is well meant for a signification of our humble and grateful acknowledgement of the benefits of Christ therein given to all worthy receivers, and for the avoiding of such profanation and disorder in the Holy Communion as might otherwise ensue. Yet, lest the same kneeling should by any persons, either out of ignorance and infirmity, or out of malice and obstinacy, be misconstrued and depraved, it is here declared that thereby no adoration is intended, or ought to be done, either unto the sacramental bread or wine there bodily received, or unto any corporeal presence of Christ's natural flesh and blood, for the sacramental bread and wine remain still in their very natural substances, and therefore may not be adored for that were idolatry to be abhorred of all faithful Christians. And the natural body and blood of our Saviour Christ are in heaven, and not here, it being against the truth of Christ's natural body to be at one time in more places than one. End of Holy Communion From the Book of Common Prayer, 1662「The Public Baptism of Infants » from the Book of Common Prayer, 1662. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Michael Maggs. The Ministration of Public Baptism of Infants to be used in the Church The people are to be admonished that it is most convenient that baptism should not be administered but on Sundays and other holy days, when the most number of people come together, as well as for that the congregation there present may testify the receiving of them that be newly baptised into the number of Christ's church, as also because in the baptism of infants every man present may be put in remembrance of his own profession made to God in his baptism, for which cause also it is expedient that baptism be ministered in the vulgar tongue, Nevertheless, if necessity so require, children may be baptised upon any other day. And note that there shall be for every male child to be baptised two godfathers and one godmother, and for every female one godfather and two godmothers. When there are children to be baptised, the parent shall give knowledge thereof overnight, or in the morning before the beginning of morning prayers, to the curate. And then the godfathers and godmothers, and the people with the children, must be ready at the font, either immediately after the last lesson at morning prayer, or else immediately after the last lesson at evening prayer, as the curate by his discretion shall appoint, 
and the priest coming to the font, which is then to be filled with pure water, and standing there, shall say, Has this child been already baptised, or no? If they answer, No, then shall the priest proceed as followeth. Dearly beloved, forasmuch as all men are conceived and born in sin, and that our Saviour Jesus Christ saith, None can enter into the kingdom of God, except he be regenerate and born anew of water and of the Holy Ghost. I beseech you to call upon God the Father, through our Lord Jesus Christ, that of his bounteous mercy he will grant to this child that thing which by nature he cannot have, that he may be baptised with water and the Holy Ghost, and received into Christ's holy church, and be made a lively member of the same. Then shall the priest say, Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, who of thy great mercy didst save Noah and his family in the ark from perishing by water, and also did safely lead the children of Israel, thy people, through the Red Sea, figuring thereby thy holy baptism, and by the baptism of thy well-beloved Son, Jesus Christ, in the river Jordan, did sanctify water to the mystical washing away of sin, we beseech thee for thine infinite mercies that thou wilt mercifully look upon this child, wash him and sanctify him with the Holy Ghost, that he, being delivered from thy wrath, may be received into the ark of Christ's church, and, being steadfast in faith, joyful through hope, and rooted in charity, may so pass the waves of this troublesome world, that finally he may come to the land of everlasting life, there to reign with thee, world without end, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty and immortal God, the aid of all that need, the helper of all that flee to thee for succour, the life of them that believe, and the resurrection of the dead, we call upon thee for this infant, that he, coming to thy holy baptism, may receive remission of his sins by spiritual regeneration. Receive him, O Lord, as thou hadst promised, by thy well-beloved Son, saying, Ask, and ye shall have, Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. So give now unto us that ask. Let us that seek find. Open the gate unto us that knock, that this infant may enjoy the everlasting benediction of thy heavenly washing, and may come to the eternal kingdom which thou hast promised by Christ our Lord. Amen. Then shall the people stand up, and the priest shall say, Hear the words of the Gospel, written by St. Mark in the tenth chapter, at the thirteenth verse. They brought young children to Christ, that he should touch them, and his disciples rebuked those that brought them. But when Jesus saw it, he was much displeased, and said unto them, Suffer little children to come unto me, and forbid them not for of such is the kingdom of God. Verily I say unto you, whoever shall not receive the kingdom of God as a little child, he shall not enter therein. And he took them up in his arms, put his hands upon them, and blessed them. After the gospel is read, the minister shall make this brief exhortation upon the words of the gospel. Beloved, Ye hear in this gospel the words of our Saviour Christ, that he commanded the children be brought unto him, how he blamed those that would have kept them from him, how he exhorteth all men to follow their innocency. Ye perceive how by this outward gesture and deed he declared his good will toward them, for he embraced them in his arms, he laid his hands upon them and blessed them. Doubt ye not, therefore, but earnestly believe 
that he will likewise favourably receive this present infant, that he will embrace him with the arms of his mercy, that he will give unto him the blessing of eternal life, and make him partaker of his everlasting kingdom. Wherefore, we being thus persuaded of the good will of our Heavenly Father towards this infant, declared by his Son Jesus Christ, and nothing doubting but that he favourably alloweth this charitable work of ours in bringing this infant to his holy baptism, let us faithfully and devoutly give thanks unto him, and say, Almighty and everlasting God, Heavenly Father, we give thee humble thanks that thou hast vouchsafed to call us to the knowledge of thy grace and faith in thee. Increase this knowledge and confirm this faith in us evermore. Give thy Holy Spirit to this infant, that he may be born again, and be made an heir of everlasting salvation through Jesus Christ, who liveth and reigneth with thee and the Holy Spirit, now and for ever. Amen. Then shall the priest speak unto the godfathers and godmothers on this wise. Dearly beloved, ye have brought this child here to be baptized. Ye have prayed that our Lord Jesus Christ would vouchsafe to receive him, to release him of his sins, to sanctify him with the Holy Ghost, to give him the kingdom of heaven and everlasting life. Ye have heard also that our Lord Jesus Christ hath promised in his gospel to grant all these things that ye have prayed for, which promise he for his part will most surely keep and perform. Wherefore, after this promise made by Christ, this infant must also faithfully for his part promise by you that are his sureties, until he come of age to take it upon himself, that he will renounce the devil and all his works, and constantly believe God's holy word, and obediently keep his commandments. I demand, therefore, dost thou in the name of this child renounce the devil and all his works? the vain pomp and glory of the world, with all covetous desires of the same, and the carnal desires of the flesh, so that thou wilt not follow nor be led by them. Answer, I renounce them all. Minister, dost thou believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ his only begotten Son, our Lord? and that he was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, that he suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried, that he went down into hell, and also did rise again the third day, that he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty, and from thence shall come again at the end of the world to judge the quick and the dead, and dost thou believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the remission of sins, the resurrection of the flesh, and everlasting life after death? Answer. All this I steadfastly believe. Minister. Wilt thou be baptized in this faith? Answer. That is my desire. Minister. Wilt thou then obediently keep God's holy will and commandments, and walk in the same all the days of thy life? Answer, I will. Then shall the priest say, O merciful God, grant that the old Adam in this child may be so buried that the new man may be raised up in him. Amen. Grant that all carnal affections may die in him, and that all things belonging to the Spirit may live and grow in him. Amen. Grant that he may have power and strength to have victory and to triumph against the devil, the world, and the flesh. Amen. Grant that whosoever is here dedicated to thee by our office and ministry may also be endued with heavenly virtues and everlastingly rewarded. Through thy mercy, O blessed Lord God, 
who dost live and govern all things, world without end. Amen. Almighty, everlasting God, whose most dearly beloved Son, Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of our sins, did shed out of his most precious side both water and blood, and gave commandment to his disciples that they should go teach all nations and baptize them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Regard, we beseech thee, the supplications of thy congregation. Sanctify this water to the mystical washing away of sin, and grant that this child, now to be baptized therein, may receive the fullness of thy grace, and ever remain in the number of thy faithful and elect children, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Then the priest shall take the child into his hands, and shall say to the godfathers and godmothers, Name this child. And then, naming it after them, if they shall certify him that the child may well endure it, he shall dip it in the water discreetly and warily, saying, N, I baptize thee in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. But if they certify that the child is weak, it shall suffice to pour water upon it, saying the foresaid words, N, I baptize thee in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Then the priest shall say, We receive this child into the congregation of Christ's flock, and do, asterisk, here the priest shall make a cross upon the child's forehead, sign him with the sign of the cross, in token that hereafter he shall not be ashamed to confess the faith of Christ crucified, and manfully to fight under his banner against sin, the world and the devil, and to continue Christ's faithful soldier and servant unto his life's end. Amen. Then shall the priest say, Seeing now, dearly beloved brethren, that this child is regenerate and grafted into the body of Christ's church, let us give thanks unto Almighty God for these benefits, and with one accord make our prayers unto him, that this child may lead the rest of his life according to this beginning. Then shall be said, all kneeling, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive them that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Then shall the priest say, We yield thee hearty thanks, most merciful Father, that it has pleased thee to regenerate this infant with thy Holy Spirit, to receive him for thine own child by adoption, and to incorporate him into thy holy church. And humbly we beseech thee to grant that he, being dead unto sin, and living unto righteousness, and being buried with Christ in his death, may crucify the old man, and utterly abolish the whole body of sin, and that, as he is made partaker of the death of thy Son, he may also be partaker of his resurrection, so that finally, with the residue of thy holy church, he may be an inheritor of thine everlasting kingdom, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Then, all standing up, the priest shall say to the godfathers and godmothers this exhortation following. For as much as this child has promised by you his sureties to renounce the devil and all his works, to believe in God and to serve him, ye must remember that it is your parts and duties to see that this infant be taught, so soon as he shall be able to learn, what a solemn vow, promise, and profession he has made here by you, and that he may know these things the better, 
ye shall call upon him to hear sermons, and chiefly ye shall provide that he may learn the creed, the Lord's Prayer, and the Ten Commandments in the vulgar tongue, and all other things which a Christian ought to know and believe to his soul's health and that this child may be virtuously brought up to live a godly and a Christian life, remembering always that baptism doth represent unto us our profession, which is to follow the example of our Saviour Christ, and to be made like unto him, that, as he died and rose again for us, so should we who are baptised die from sin and rise again into righteousness, continually mortifying all our evil and corrupt affections, and daily proceeding in all virtue and goodliness of living. Then shall he add and say, Ye are to take care that this child be brought to the bishop to be confirmed by him, so soon as he can say the creed, the Lord's Prayer and the Ten Commandments in the vulgar tongue, and be further instructed in the church catechism set forth for that purpose. It is certain by God's word that children which are baptised, dying before they commit actual sin, are undoubtedly saved. To take away all scruple concerning the sign of the cross in baptism, the true explication thereof, and the just reasons for the retaining of it, may be seen in the Thirtieth Canon, first published in the year 1604. End of the Public Baptism of Infants The Order of Confirmation From the Book of Common Prayer, 1662 This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Michael Maggs The Order of Confirmation, or Laying on of Hands upon Those that are Baptised and Come to Years of Discretion Upon the day appointed, all that are to be then confirmed being placed and standing in order before the bishop, he, or some other minister appointed by him, shall read this preface following. To the end that confirmation may be ministered to the more edifying of such as shall receive it, the Church hath thought it good to order that none hereafter shall be confirmed, but such as can say the Creed, the Lord's Prayer, and the Ten Commandments, and can also answer to such other questions as in the short catechism are contained, which order is very convenient to be observed, to the end that children being now come to the years of discretion, and having learned what their godfathers and godmothers promised for them in baptism, they may themselves, with their own mouth and consent, openly before the church, ratify and confirm the same and also promise that by the grace of God they will evermore endeavour themselves faithfully to observe such things as they by their own confession have assented unto. Then shall the bishop say, Do ye here, in the presence of God and of this congregation, renew the solemn promise and vow that was made in your name at your baptism, ratifying and confirming the same in your own persons, and acknowledging yourselves bound to believe and to do all those things which your godfathers and godmothers then undertook for you. And every one shall audibly answer, I do. The Bishop. Our help is in the name of the Lord. Answer. Who hath made heaven and earth. Bishop. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Answer. Henceforth, world without end. Bishop, Lord, hear our prayers. Answer, and let our cry come unto thee. Bishop, let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, who hath vouchsafed to regenerate these thy servants by water and the Holy Ghost, and hast given unto them forgiveness of all their sins, strengthen them, we beseech thee, O Lord, with the Holy Spirit the Comforter, and daily increase in them the manifold gifts of grace, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and ghostly strength, 
the spirit of knowledge and true godliness, and fill them, O Lord, with the spirit of thy holy fear, now and for ever. Amen. Then, all of them in order, kneeling before the bishop, he shall lay his hand upon the head of every one severally, saying, Defend, O Lord, this child, or this thy servant, with thy heavenly grace, that he may continue thine for ever, and daily increase in thy Holy Spirit more and more, until he come unto thy everlasting kingdom. Amen. Then shall the bishop say, The Lord be with you. Answer, and with thy spirit. And, all kneeling down, the bishop shall add, Let us pray. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive them that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. And this collect. Almighty and everlasting God, who makest us both to will and to do those things that be good and acceptable unto thy divine majesty, we make our humble supplications unto thee for these thy servants, upon whom, after the example of thy holy apostles, we have now laid our hands, to certify them by this sign of thy favour and gracious goodness towards them. Let thy fatherly hand, we beseech thee, ever be over them. Let thy Holy Spirit ever be with them, and so lead them in the knowledge and obedience of thy word, that in the end they may obtain everlasting life. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, who with thee and the Holy Ghost liveth and reigneth, ever one God, world without end. Amen. O Almighty Lord and everlasting God, Vouchsafe, we beseech thee to direct, sanctify, and govern both our hearts and bodies in the ways of thy laws and in the works of thy commandments, that through thy most mighty protection, both here and ever, we may be preserved in body and soul, through our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Then the bishop shall bless them, saying thus, the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, be upon you and remain with you for ever. Amen. And there shall none be admitted to the Holy Communion until such time as he be confirmed, or be ready and desirous to be confirmed. End of the Order of Confirmation The Form of Solemnization of Matrimony from the Book of Common Prayer, 1662. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Michael Max. The Form of Solemnization of Matrimony. First, the bands of all that are to be married together must be published in the church three several Sundays or holy days in the time of divine service immediately before the sentences for the offertory, the curate saying, after the accustomed manner, I publish the bands of marriage between M of blank and N of blank. If any of you know any just cause or just impediment why these two persons should not be joined together in holy matrimony, ye are to declare it. This is the first, second or third, time of asking. And if the persons that are to be married dwell in diverse parishes, the bands must be asked in both parishes. And the curate of the one parish shall not solemnize matrimony betwixt them without a certificate of the bands being thrice asked from the curate of the other parish. At the day and time appointed for solemnization of matrimony, the persons to be married shall come into the body of the church with their friends and neighbours, and there, standing together, the man on the right hand and the woman on the left, the priest shall say, Dearly beloved, 
We are gathered together here in the sight of God and in the face of this congregation to join together this man and this woman in holy matrimony, which is an honourable estate, instituted of God in the time of man's innocency, signifying unto us the mystical union that is betwixt Christ and his church, which holy estate Christ adorned and beautified with his presence and first miracle that he wrought in Cana of Galilee, and is commended of St. Paul to be honourable among all men, and therefore is not by any to be enterprised, nor taken in hand, unadvisedly, lightly, or wantonly, to satisfy men's carnal lusts and appetites like brute beasts that have no understanding, but reverently, discreetly, advisedly, soberly, and in the fear of God duly considering the causes for which matrimony was ordained. First, it was ordained for the procreation of children, to be brought up in the fear and nurture of the Lord, and to the praise of his holy name. Secondly, it was ordained for a remedy against sin and to avoid fornication, that such persons as have not the gift of continency might marry and keep themselves undefiled members of Christ's body. Thirdly, it was ordained for the mutual society, help, and comfort that the one ought to have of the other, both in prosperity and adversity, into which holy estate these two persons present come now to be joined. Therefore, if any man can show any just cause why they may not lawfully be joined together, let him now speak, or else hereafter for ever hold his peace. And also, speaking unto the persons that shall be married, he shall say, I require and charge you both, as ye will answer at the dreadful day of judgment, when the secrets of all hearts shall be disclosed, that if either of you know any impediment, why ye may not lawfully be joined together in matrimony, ye do now confess it. For be ye well assured, that so many as are coupled together, otherwise than God's word doth allow, are not joined together by God, neither is their matrimony lawful. At which day of marriage, if any man do allege and declare any impediment why they may not be coupled together in matrimony by God's law or the laws of this realm, and will be bound and sufficient sureties with him to the parties, or else put in a caution to the full value of such charges as the persons to be married to thereby sustain to prove his allegation, then the solemnization must be deferred until such time as the truth be tried. If no impediment be alleged, then shall the curate say unto the man, M. Wilt thou have this woman to thy wedded wife, to live together after God's ordinance in the holy estate of matrimony? Wilt thou love her, comfort her, honour and keep her, in sickness and in health, and, forsaking all other, keep thee only unto her, so long as she both shall live? The man shall answer, I will. Then shall the priest say unto the woman, En, wilt thou have this man to thy wedded husband, to live together after God's ordinance in the holy estate of matrimony? Wilt thou obey him and serve him, love, honour, and keep him, in sickness and in health, and, forsaking all other, keep thee only unto him, so long as ye both shall live? The woman shall answer, I will. Then shall the minister say, Who giveth this woman to be married to this man? Then shall they give their troth to each other in this manner. The minister receiving the woman at her father's or friend's hands, shall cause the man with his right hand to take the woman by her left hand, and to say after him, as followeth, I, M, take thee, N, to my wedded wife, to have and to hold from this day forward, for better for worse, for richer for poorer, in sickness and in health, to love and to cherish till death us do part, according to God's holy ordinance, and thereto I plight thee my troth. 
Then shall they loose their hands, and the woman, with her right hand, taking the man by his right hand, shall likewise say after the minister, I, N, take thee, M, to my wedded husband, to have and to hold, from this day forward, for better for worse, for richer for poorer, in sickness and in health, to love, cherish, and to obey, till death us do part, according to God's holy ordinance, and thereto I give thee my troth. Then shall they again loose their hands, and the man shall give unto the woman a ring, laying the same upon the book with the accustomed duty to the priest and clerk. And the priest, taking the ring, shall deliver it unto the man to put upon the fourth finger of the woman's left hand. And the man, holding the ring there, and taught by the priest, shall say, With this ring I thee wed, with my body I thee worship, and with all my worldly goods I thee endow, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Then the man, leaving the ring upon the fourth finger of the woman's left hand, they shall both kneel down, and the ministers shall say, Let us pray. O eternal God, creator and preserver of all mankind, giver of all spiritual grace, the author of everlasting life, send thy blessing upon these thy servants, this man and this woman, whom we bless in thy name that, as Isaac and Rebekah lived faithfully together, so these persons may surely perform and keep the vow and covenant betwixt them made, whereof this ring, given and received, is a token and pledge, and may ever remain in perfect love and peace together, and live according to thy laws, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Then shall the priest join their right hands together, and say, those whom God hath joined together, let no man put asunder. Then shall the minister speak unto the people, For as much as M and N have consented together in holy wedlock, and have witnessed the same before God and this company, and thereto have given and pledged their troth either to other, and have declared the same by giving and receiving of a ring, and by joining of hands, I pronounce that they be man and wife together, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. And the minister shall add this blessing. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost, bless, preserve, and keep you. The Lord mercifully with his favour look upon you, and so fill you with all spiritual benediction and grace, that ye may so live together in this life that in the world to come ye may have life everlasting. Amen. Then the minister or clerks, going to the Lord's table, shall say or sing this psalm following. Beati Omnes, Psalm 128 Blessed are all they that fear the Lord, and walk in his ways. For thou shalt eat the labour of thine hands, O well is thee, and happy shalt thou be. The wife shall be as the fruitful vine upon the walls of the house, the children like the olive branches round about thy table. Lord, thus shall the man be blessed that feareth the Lord. The Lord from out of Zion shall so bless thee that thou shalt see Jerusalem in prosperity all thy life long. Yea, that thou shalt see thy children's children and peace upon Israel. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Or this psalm, Deus Miseriator, Psalm 67. God, be merciful unto us, and bless us, and show us the light of thy countenance, and be merciful unto us, that thy way may be known upon earth, thy saving health among all nations. Let the people praise thee, O God, yea, let all the people praise thee. O let the nations rejoice and be glad, for thou shalt judge the folk righteously, and govern the nations upon earth. 
Let the people praise thee, O God, yea, let all the people praise thee. Then shall the earth bring forth her increase, and God, even our own God, shall give us his blessing. God shall bless us, and all the ends of the world shall fear him. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. The psalm ended, and the man and the woman kneeling before the Lord's table, the priest standing at the table and turning his face towards them, shall say, Lord, have mercy upon us. Answer, Christ, have mercy upon us. Minister, Lord, have mercy upon us. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive them that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Minister, O Lord, save thy servant and thy handmaid. Answer, who put their trust in thee. Minister, O Lord, send them help from thy holy place. Answer, and evermore defend them. Minister, be unto them a tower of strength. Answer, from the face of their enemy. Minister, O Lord, hear our prayer. Answer, and let our cry come unto thee. Minister, O God of Abraham, God of Isaac, God of Jacob, bless these thy servants, and sow the seed of eternal life in their hearts, that whatsoever in thy holy word they shall profitably learn, they may indeed fulfil the same. Look, O Lord, mercifully upon them from heaven, and bless them, as thou didst send thy blessing upon Abraham and Sarah to thy great comfort. So vouchsafe to send thy blessing upon these thy servants, that they, obeying thy will, and alway being in safety under thy protection, may abide in thy love until their lives end. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. This prayer next following shall be omitted where the woman is past childbearing. O merciful Lord and Heavenly Father, by whose gracious gift mankind is increased, we beseech thee assist with thy blessing these two persons, that they may both be fruitful in procreation of children, and also live together so long in godly love and honesty, that they may see their children Christianly and virtuously brought up, to thy praise and honour. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. O God, who by thy almighty power hast made all things of nothing, who also, after other things set in order, didst appoint that out of man, created after thine own image and similitude, woman should take her beginning, and knitting them together, didst teach that it should never be lawful to put asunder those whom thou by matrimony hast made one. O God, who hast consecrated the state of matrimony to such an excellent mystery, that in it is signified and represented the spiritual marriage and unity betwixt Christ and his church. Look mercifully upon these thy servants, that both this man may love his wife according to thy word, as Christ did love his spouse the church, who gave himself for it, loving and cherishing it even as his own flesh, and also that this woman may be loving and amiable, faithful and obedient to her husband, and in all quietness and sobriety and peace be a follower of holy and godly matrons. O Lord, bless them both, and grant them to inherit thy everlasting kingdom. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Then shall the priest say, Almighty God, who at the beginning did create our first parents, Adam and Eve, and did sanctify and join them together in marriage, pour upon you the riches of his grace, sanctify and bless you, that ye may please him both in body and soul, and live together in holy love until your lives end. Amen. 
After which, if there be no sermon declaring the duties of man and wife, the minister shall read as followeth. All ye that are married, or that intend to take the holy estate of matrimony upon you, hear what the Holy Scripture doth say as touching the duties of husbands towards their wives, and wives towards their husbands. St. Paul, in his epistle to the Ephesians, the fifth chapter, doth give this commandment to all married men. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself, for no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord the Church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the Church. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife, even as himself. Ephesians 5, verse 25. Likewise the same St. Paul, writing to the Colossians, speaketh thus unto all men that are married, Husbands, love your wives, and be not bitter against them. Colossians 3, verse 19. Hear also what St. Peter the Apostle of Christ, who was himself a married man, saith unto them that are married, Ye husbands, dwell with your wives according to knowledge, giving honour unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel, and as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers are not hindered. 1 St. Peter 3 verse 7 Hitherto ye have heard the duty of the husband towards the wife. Now, likewise, ye wives hear and learn your duties to your husbands, even as it is plainly set forth in Holy Scripture. St. Paul, in the aforenamed epistle to the Ephesians, teaches you thus, Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the saviour of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. And again he saith, Let the wife see that she reverence her husband. Ephesians 5 verse 22 And in his epistle to the Colossians, St. Paul giveth you this short lesson. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands, as it is fit in the Lord. Colossians 3 verse 18 St. Peter also doth instruct you very well, thus saying, Ye wives, be in subjugation to your husbands, that if any obey not the word, they also may without the word be won by the conversation of their wives, while they behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear. Whose adorning, let it not be that outward adorning of plaiting the hair and of wearing of gold, or of putting on of apparel, but let it be the hidden man of the heart, in that which is not corruptible, even the adornment of a meek and quiet spirit, which is, in the sight of God, of great price. For after this manner in the old time, holy women also who trusted in God adorned themselves, being in subjugation unto their own husbands, even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters ye are, so long as ye do well, and are not afraid with any amazement. 1 St. Peter 3, verse 1 It is convenient that the newly married persons should receive the Holy Communion at the time of their marriage, or at the first opportunity after their marriage. End of The Solemnization of Matrimony
The Order for the Burial of the Dead from the Book of Common Prayer, 1662. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Michael Max. The Order for the Burial of the Dead. Here is to be noted that the office ensuing is not to be used for any that die unbaptized or excommunicate, or have laid violent hands upon themselves. The priest and clerks, meeting the corpse at the entrance of the churchyard, and going before it, either into the church or towards the grave, shall say or sing, I am the resurrection and the life, saith the Lord. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. St. John 11, verses 25 and 26. I know that my Redeemer liveth, and that he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth. And though after my skin worms destroy this body, yet in my flesh shall I see God, whom I shall see for myself, and mine eyes shall behold and not another. Job 19, verses 25, 26, and 27. We brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. The Lord gave, and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. 1 Timothy verses 6 and 7. Job 1 verse 21. After they are come into the church, shall be read one or both of these psalms following. Psalm 39, Dixie Custodiam. I said, I will take heed to my ways, that I offend not in my tongue. I will keep my mouth as it were with a bridle, while the ungodly is in my sight. I held my tongue and spake nothing. I kept silence, yea, even from good words, but it was pain and grief to me. My heart was hot within me, and while I was thus musing the fire kindled, and at the last I spake with my tongue. Lord, let me know mine end and the number of my days, that I may be certified how long I have to live. Behold, thou hast made my days as it were a span long, and mine age is even as nothing in respect of thee, and verily every man living is altogether vanity. For man walketh in a vain shadow, and disquieteth himself in vain. He heapeth up riches, and cannot tell who shall gather them. And now, Lord, what is my hope? Truly my hope is even in thee. Deliver me from all mine offences, and make me not a rebuke unto the foolish. I became dumb, and open not my mouth, for it was thy doing. Take thy plague away from me. I am even consumed by means of thy heavy hand. When thou with rebukes dost chasten man for sin, Thou makest his beauty to consume away, like as it were a moth fretting a garment. Every man, therefore, is but vanity. Hear my prayer, O Lord, and with thine ears consider my calling. Hold not thy peace at my tears. For I am a stranger with thee, and a sojourner as all my fathers were. O oh, spare me a little, that I may recover my strength before I go hence and be no more seen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Psalm 90, Domine Refugium Lord, thou hast been our refuge from one generation to another, before the mountains were brought forth, or ever the earth and the world were made, thou art God from everlasting and world without end. Thou turnest man to destruction, again thou sayest, Come again, ye children of men. For a thousand years in thy sight are but as yesterday, seeing that is past as a watch in the night. As soon as thou scatterest them, they are even as sheep, and fade away suddenly like the grass. In the morning it is green and groweth up, but in the evening it is cut down, dried up and withered. 
for we consume away in thy displeasure, and are afraid at thy wrathful indignation. Thou hast set our misdeeds before thee, and our secret sins in the light of thy countenance. For when thou art angry, all our days are gone. We bring our years to an end, as it were a tale that is told. The days of our age are threescore years and ten, and though men be so strong that they come to fourscore years, yet is their strength zen but labour and sorrow. So soon passeth it away, and we are gone. But who regardeth the power of thy wrath? For even thereafter as a man feareth, so is thy displeasure. O oh, teach us to number our days, that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. Turn thee again, O Lord, at the last, and be gracious unto thy servants. O oh, satisfy us with thy mercy, and that soon, so shall we rejoice and be glad all the days of our life. Comfort us again now, after the time that thou hast plagued us, and for the years wherein we have suffered adversity. Show thy servants thy work, and their children thy glory. And the glorious majesty of the Lord our God be upon us. Prosper thou the work of our hands upon us. O oh, prosper thou our handiwork. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Then shall follow the lesson taken out of the fifteenth chapter of the former epistle of St. Paul to the Corinthians. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 20. Now is Christ risen from the dead, and became the firstfruits of them that slept. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. But every man in his own order, Christ the firstfruits, afterwards they that are Christ's at his coming. Then cometh the end, when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and power, for he must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death, for he hath put all things under his feet. But when he saith, All things are put under him, it is manifest that he is accepted which did put all things under him. And when all things shall be subdued unto him, then shall the Son also himself be subject unto him that put all things under him, that God may be all in all. Else what shall they do which are baptized for the dead, if the dead rise not at all? Why are they then baptized for the dead? And why stand we in jeopardy every hour? I protest by your rejoicing, which I have in Christ Jesus our Lord, I die daily. If after the manner of men I have fought with beasts at Ephesus, what advantageth it me if the dead rise not? Let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. Be not deceived, evil communications corrupt good manners. Awake to righteousness and sin not, for some have not the knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame. But some man will say, How are the dead raised up? And with what body do they come? Thou fool, that which thou sowest is not quickened except it die. And that which thou sowest, thou sowest not that body that shall be, but bare grain. It may chance of wheat or of some other grain, but God giveth it a body as it hath pleased him and to every seed his own body. All flesh is not the same flesh, but there is one kind of flesh of men, another flesh of beasts, another of fishes, and another of birds. There are also celestial bodies, and bodies terrestrial. 
But the glory of the celestial is one, and the glory of the terrestrial is another. There is one glory of the sun, and another glory of the moon, and another glory of the stars. For one star differeth from another star in glory. So also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown in corruption, it is raised in incorruption. It is sown in dishonour, it is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness, it is raised in power. It is sown a natural body, it is raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body, and there is a spiritual body. And so it is written, The first man Adam was made a living soul, the last Adam was made a quickening spirit. Howbeit that was not first which was spiritual, but that which is natural, and afterwards that which is spiritual. The first man is of the earth, earthy. The second man is the Lord from heaven. And is the earthy such as they that are earthy? And is the heaven such as they also that are heavenly? And as we have borne the image of the earthy, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye know that your labour is not in vain in the Lord. When they come to the grave, while the corpse is made ready to be laid into the earth, the priest shall say, or the priest and clerks shall sing, Man that is born of a woman, hath but a short time to live, and is full of misery. He cometh up, and is cut down like a flower. He fleeth as it were a shadow, and never continueth in one stay. In the midst of life we are in death. Of whom may we seek for succour, but of thee, O Lord, who for our sins art justly displeased? Yet, O Lord God most holy, O Lord most mighty, O holy and most merciful Saviour, deliver us not into the bitter pains of eternal death. Thou knowest, Lord, the secrets of our hearts. Shut not thy merciful ears to our prayers, but spare us, Lord most holy, O God most mighty, O holy and most merciful Saviour, thou most worthy judge eternal. Suffer us not at our last hour for any pains of death to fall from thee. Then, while the earth shall be cast upon the body by some standing by, the priest shall say, For as much as it hath pleased Almighty God of his great mercy to take unto himself the soul of our dear brother here departed, we therefore commit his body to the ground. Earth to earth, ashes to ashes, dust to dust, in sure and certain hope of the resurrection to eternal life, through our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body that it may be like unto his glorious body, 
according to the mighty working whereby he is able to subdue all things to himself. Then shall be said or sung, I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Write, from henceforth, Blessed are the dead which die in the Lord. Even so saith the Spirit, for they rest from their labours. Revelation 14 verse 13 Then the priest shall say, Lord, have mercy upon us. Christ, have mercy upon us. Lord, have mercy upon us. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive them that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Priest, Almighty God, with whom do live the spirits of them that depart hence in the Lord, and with whom the souls of the faithful, after they are delivered from the burden of the flesh, are in joy and felicity, we give thee hearty thanks, for that it hath pleased thee to deliver this our brother out of the miseries of this sinful world, beseeching thee that it may please thee of thy gracious goodness shortly to accomplish the number of thine elect and to hasten thy kingdom, that we, with all those that are departed in the true face of thy holy name, may have our perfect consummation and bliss, both in body and soul, in thy eternal and everlasting glory, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The Collect O merciful God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who is the resurrection and the life, in him whomsoever believeth shall live, though he die, and whosoever liveth and believeth in him shall not die eternally, who also hath taught us by his holy apostle St. Paul not to be sorry as men without hope for them that sleep in him. We meekly beseech thee, O Father, to raise us from the death of sin unto the life of righteousness, that when we shall depart this life we may rest in him, as our hope is this our brother doeth, and that at the general resurrection in the last day we may be found acceptable in thy sight, and receive that blessing which thy well-beloved Son shall then pronounce to all that love and fear thee, saying, Come, ye blessed children of my Father, receive the kingdom prepared for you from the beginning of the world. Grant this, we beseech thee, O merciful Father, through Jesus Christ, our Mediator and Redeemer. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Ghost, be with us all evermore. Amen. End of The Order for the Burial of the Dead Articles from the Book of Common Prayer, 1662 This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Michael Maggs Articles agreed upon by the archbishops and bishops of both provinces and the whole clergy in the convocation holden at London in the year 1562, for the avoiding of diversities of opinions and for the establishing of consent touching true religion. Reprinted by His Majesty's commandment with His Royal Declaration prefixed thereunto. His Majesty's Declaration being by God's ordinance, according to our just title, Defender of the Faith and Supreme Governor of the Church, within these our dominions, we hold it most agreeable to this our kingly office and our own religious zeal to conserve and maintain the Church committed to our charge in the unity of true religion and in the bond of peace, and not to suffer unnecessary disputations altercations or questions to be raised which may nourish faction 
both in the Church and Commonwealth. We have therefore, upon mature deliberation, and with the advice of so many of our bishops as might conveniently be called together, thought fit to make this declaration following. That the Articles of the Church of England, which have been allowed and authorised heretofore, and which our clergy generally have subscribed unto, do contain the true doctrine of the Church of England, agreeable to God's word, which we do therefore ratify and confirm, requiring all our loving subjects to continue in the uniform profession thereof, and prohibiting the least difference from the said articles, which to that end we command to be new printed, and this our declaration to be published therewith. That we are supreme governor of the Church of England, and that if any difference arise about the external policy concerning the injunctions, canons, and other constitutions whatsoever thereto belonging, the clergy in their convocation is to order and settle them, having first obtained leave under our broad seal to do so, we approving their said ordinances and constitutions, provided that none be made contrary to the laws and customs of the land. That out of our princely care, that the churchmen may do the work which is proper unto them, the bishops and clergy from time to time in convocation, upon their humble desire, shall have licence under our broad seal to deliberate of and to do all such things as being made plain by them and dissented unto by us shall concern the settled continuance of the doctrine and discipline of the Church of England now established from which we will not endure any varying or departing in the least degree. That for the present, though some differences have been ill-raised, yet we take comfort in this, that all clergymen within our realm have always most willingly subscribed to the articles established, which is an argument to us that they all agree in the true, usual, literal meaning of the said articles, and that even in those curious points in which the present differences lie, men of all sorts take the articles of the Church of England to be for them, which is an argument again that none of them intend any desertion of the articles established. That therefore in these both curious and unhappy differences which have for so many hundred years, in different times and places, exercised the Church of Christ, we will that all further curious search be laid aside, and these disputes shut up in God's promises, as they be generally set forth to us in the Holy Scriptures, and the general meaning of the articles of the Church of England according to them, and that no man thereafter shall either print or preach to draw the article aside any way, but shall submit to it in the plain and full meaning thereof, and shall not put his own sense or comment to be the meaning of the article, but shall take it in the literal and grammatical sense. That if any public reader in either of our universities, or any head or master of a college, or any other person respectively in either of them, shall affix any new sense to any article, or shall publicly read, determine, or hold any public disputation, or suffer any such to be held either way, in either the universities or colleges respectively, or if any divine in the universities shall preach or print anything either way, other than is already established in convocation with our royal assent, he, or they the offenders, shall be liable to our displeasure, and the Church's censure in our commission ecclesiastical, as well as any other. And we shall see there shall be due execution upon them. Articles of Religion 1. Of Faith in the Holy Trinity 
There is but one living and true God, everlasting, without body, parts, or passions, of infinite power, wisdom, and goodness, the maker and preserver of all things, both visible and invisible. And in unity of this Godhead there be three persons of one substance, power, and eternity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. 2. Of the Word or Son of God, which was made very man. The Son, which is the Word of the Father, begotten from everlasting of the Father, the very and eternal God, and of one substance with the Father, took man's nature in the womb of the Blessed Virgin of her substance, so that the two whole and perfect natures, that is to say, the Godhead and the manhood, were joined together in one person, never to be divided, whereof is one Christ, very God and very man, who truly suffered, was crucified, dead and buried, to reconcile his Father to us, and to be a sacrifice, not only for original guilt, but also for actual sins of men. 3. Of the going down of Christ into hell. As Christ died for us and was buried, so also it is to believed that he went down into hell. 4. Of the resurrection of Christ. Christ did truly rise again from death, and took again his body with flesh, bones, and all things appertaining to the perfection of man's nature, wherewith he ascended into heaven, and there sitteth until he returns to judge all men at the last day. 5. Of the Holy Ghost The Holy Ghost, proceeding from the Father and the Son, is of one substance, majesty and glory, with the Father and the Son, very and eternal God. 6. Of the sufficiency of the Holy Scriptures for salvation. Holy Scripture containeth all things necessary to salvation, so that whatsoever is not read therein, nor may be proved thereby, is not to be required of any man, that it should be believed as an article of the faith, or be thought requisite or necessary to salvation. In the name of the Holy Scripture we do understand those canonical books of the Old and New Testament of whose authority was never any doubt in the Church. Of the names and number of the canonical books Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, First Book of Samuel, the Second Book of Samuel, the First Book of Kings, the Second Book of Kings, the first book of Chronicles, the second book of Chronicles, the first book of Estras, the second book of Estras, the book of Esther, the book of Job, the Psalms, the Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, or the Preacher, Cantica, or the Songs of Solomon, four prophets the greater, twelve prophets the less. And the other books, as Hierome saith, the Church doth read for example of life, and instruction of manners, but yet does it not apply them to establish any doctrine, such as are the following. The third book of Estras, the fourth book of Estras, the book of Tobias, the book of Judas, the rest of the book of Hester, the book of Wisdom, Jesus the son of Sirach, Baruch the prophet, the song of the three children, the story of Susanna, of Bel and the dragon, the prayer of Manasses, the first book of Maccabees, the second book of Maccabees. All of the books of the New Testament, as they are commonly received, we do receive and account them canonical. 7. Of the Old Testament The Old Testament is not contrary to the New, for both in the Old and New Testament everlasting life is offered to mankind by Christ, who is the only mediator between God and man, being both God and man. Wherefore, they are not to be heard, which feign that the old fathers did look only for transitory promises. Although the law given from God by Moses, as touching ceremonies and rites, did not bind Christian men, 
nor the civil precepts thereof, ought of necessity to be received in any commonwealth, yet notwithstanding, no Christian man whatsoever is free from the obedience of the commandments which are called moral. 8. Of the Creeds The three creeds, Nicene Creed, Athanasius's Creed, and that which is commonly called the Apostles' Creed, ought thoroughly to be received and believed, for they may be proved by most certain warrants of Holy Scripture. 9. Of Original or Birth Sin Original sin standeth not in the following of Adam, as the Pelagians do vainly talk, but it is the fault and corruption of the nature of every man that naturally is engendered of the offspring of Adam, whereby man is very far gone from the original righteousness and is of his own nature inclined to evil, so that the flesh lusteth always contrary to the spirit, and therefore in every person born into this world it deserveth God's wrath and damnation. And this infection of nature doth remain, yea, in them that are regenerated, whereby the lust of the flesh, called in Greek phronimasakos, which some do expound the wisdom, some sensuality, some the affection, some the desire of the flesh, is not subject to the law of God. And though there is no condemnation for them that believe and are baptized, yet the apostle does confess that concupiscence and lust hath of itself the nature of sin. 10. Of free will. The condition of man after the fall of Adam is such that he cannot turn and prepare himself by his own natural strength and good works to faith and calling upon God. Wherefore we have no power to do good works pleasant and acceptable to God without the grace of God by Christ preventing us, that we may have a good will and working with us when we have that good will. 11. Of the Justification of Man We are accounted righteous before God only for the merit of our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ, by faith and not of our own works or deservings. Wherefore, that we are justified by faith only is a most wholesome doctrine, and very full of comfort, as more largely is expressed in the homily of justification. 12. Of Good Works Albeit that good works, which are the fruits of faith, and follow after justification, cannot put away our sins, and endure the severity of God's judgment. Yet are they pleasing and acceptable to God in Christ, and do spring out necessarily of a true and lively faith, inasmuch that by them a lively faith may be as evidently known as a tree discerned by the fruit. 13. Of Works Before Justification Works done before the grace of Christ and the inspiration of his Spirit are not pleasant to God, forasmuch as they spring not of faith in Jesus Christ, neither do they make men meet to receive grace, or, as the school authors say, deserve grace of congruity. Yea, rather for that they are not done as God hath willed and commanded them to be done, we doubt not, but they have the nature of sin. 14. Of Works of Supererogation Voluntary works besides, over and above God's commandments, which they call works of supererogation, cannot be taught without arrogancy and impiety. For by them men do declare that they do not only render unto God as much as they are bound to do, but that they do more for his sake than of bounden duty is required. Whereas Christ saith plainly, When ye have done all that are commanded to you, say, We are unprofitable servants. 15. Of Christ alone without sin. Christ, in the truth of our nature, was made like unto us in all things, 
sin only except, from which he was clearly void, both in his flesh and in his spirit. He came to be the Lamb without spot, who, by sacrificing of himself once made, should take away the sins of the world. And sin, as St. John says, was not in him. But all we the rest, although baptised and born again in Christ, yet offend in many things. And if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. 16. Of Sin After Baptism Not every deadly sin willingly committed after baptism is sin against the Holy Ghost and unpardonable. Wherefore the grant of repentance is not to be denied to such as fall into sin after baptism. After we have received the Holy Ghost, we may depart from grace given and fall into sin, and by the grace of God we may rise again and amend our lives. And therefore they are to be condemned which say they can no more sin as long as they live here, or deny the place of forgiveness to such as truly repent. 17. Of Predestination and Election Predestination to life is the everlasting purpose of God, whereby, before the foundations of the world were laid, he hath constantly decreed by his counsel, secret to us, to deliver from curse and damnation those whom he hath chosen in Christ out of mankind, and to bring them by Christ to everlasting salvation as vessels made to honour. Wherefore, they which be endued with so excellent a benefit of God, be called according to God's purpose by his Spirit working in due season. They through grace obey the calling. They be justified freely. They be made sons of God by adoption. They be made like the image of his only begotten Son, Jesus Christ. They walk religiously in good works, and at length, by God's mercy, they attain to everlasting felicity. As the godly consideration of predestination and our election in Christ is full of sweet, pleasant, and unspeakable comfort to godly persons, and such as feel in themselves the working of the Spirit of Christ, mortifying the works of the flesh and their earthly members, and drawing up their mind to high and heavenly things, as well because it doth greatly establish and confirm their faith of eternal salvation to be enjoyed through Christ, as because it doth fervently kindle their love toward God. So, for curious and carnal persons, lacking the Spirit of Christ, to have continually before their eyes the sentence of God's predestination is a most dangerous downfall, whereby the devil doth thrust them either into desperation or into wretchedness of most unclean living, no less perilous than desperation. Furthermore, we must receive God's promises in such wise as they be generally set forth to us in Holy Scripture, and in all our doings that will of God is to be followed, which we have expressly declared unto us in the Word of God. 18 of obtaining eternal salvation only by the name of Christ. They also are to be had accursed that presume to say that every man shall be saved by the law or sect which he professeth, so that he be diligent to frame his life according to that law and the law of nature. For holy scripture doth set out unto us only the name of Jesus Christ, whereby men must be saved. 19. Of the Church The visible Church of Christ is a congregation of faithful men, in the which the pure word of God is preached, and the sacraments be duly ministered according to Christ's ordinance, in all those things that of necessity are requisite to the same. As the Church of Jerusalem, Alexandria and Antioch have erred, 
so also the Church of Rome hath erred, not only in their living and manner of ceremonies, but also in matters of faith. 20. Of the Authority of the Church The Church hath power to decree rites or ceremonies, and authority in controversies of faith. And yet it is not lawful for the Church to ordain anything that is contrary to God's word written. Neither may it so expand one place of Scripture that it be repugnant to another. Wherefore, although the Church be a witness and keeper of holy writ, yet, as it ought not to decree anything against the same, so, besides the same, ought it not to enforce anything to be believed for necessity of salvation? 21. Of the authority of general councils. General councils may not be gathered together without the commandment and will of princes. And when they be gathered together, for as much as they be an assembly of men, whereof all be not governed with the Spirit and Word of God, they may err and may sometime have erred, even in things pertaining unto God. Wherefore, things ordained by them as necessary to salvation have neither strength nor authority, unless it may be declared that they be taken out of Holy Scripture. 22. Of Purgatory The Romish doctrine concerning purgatory, pardons, worshipping and adoration as well as of images of relics, and also invocation of saints, is a fond thing, vainly invented, and grounded upon no warranty of Scripture, but rather repugnant to the Word of God. 23. Of Ministering in the Congregation It is not lawful for any man to take upon him the office of public preaching, or ministering the sacraments in the congregation, before he be lawfully called and sent to execute the same. And those we ought to judge lawfully called and sent, which be chosen and called to this work, by men who have public authority given unto them in the congregation, to call and send ministers in the Lord's vineyard. 24. Of speaking in the congregation in such a tongue as the people understand us. It is a thing plainly repugnant to the word of God and the custom of the primitive church to have public prayer in the church or to minister the sacraments in a tongue not understanded by the people. 25. Of the Sacraments Sacraments ordained of Christ be not only badges or tokens of Christian men's profession, but rather they be certain sure witnesses and effectual signs of grace and God's will towards us, by the which he doth work invisibly in us, and doth not only quicken but also strengthen and confirm our faith in him. There are two sacraments ordained of Christ our Lord in the gospel, that is to say, baptism and the supper of the Lord. Those five commonly called sacraments, that is to say, confirmation, penance, orders, matrimony, and extreme unction, are not to be counted for sacraments of the gospel, being such as have grown partly of the corrupt following of the apostles, partly are states of life allowed in the scriptures, but yet have not like nature of sacraments with baptism and the Lord's Supper, for that they have not any visible sign or ceremony ordained of God. The sacraments were not ordained of Christ to be gazed upon or to be carried about, but that we should duly use them, and in such only as worthily receive the same they have a wholesome effect or operation. But they that receive them unworthily purchase to themselves damnation, as St. Paul saith. 26. Of the unworthiness of ministers, which hinders not the effect of the sacraments. Although in the visible church 
the evil be ever mingled with the good, and sometime the evil have chief authority in the ministration of the word and the sacraments, yet, forasmuch as they do not the same in their own name but in Christ's, and do minister by his commission and authority, we may use their ministry, both in hearing the word of God and in receiving the sacraments. Neither is the effect of Christ's ordinance taken away by their wickedness, nor the grace of God's gifts diminished from such as by faith and rightly do receive the sacraments ministered unto them, which be effectual because of Christ's institution and promise, though they be ministered by evil men. Nevertheless, it appertaineth to the discipline of the church that inquiry be made of evil ministers, and that they may be accused of those who have knowledge of their offences, and finally, being found guilty, by just judgment be deposed. 27. Of Baptism Baptism is not only a sign of profession and mark of difference, whereby Christian men are discerned from others that be not christened, but it is also a sign of regeneration or new birth, whereby, as an instrument, they that receive baptism rightly are grafted into the church. The promises of the forgiveness of sin and of our adoption to be the sons of God by the Holy Ghost are visibly signed and sealed. Faith is confirmed and grace increased by the virtue of prayer unto God. The baptism of young children is in any wise to be retained in the church as most agreeable with the institution of Christ. 28. Of the Lord's Supper The Supper of the Lord is not only a sign of the love that Christians ought to have among themselves, one to another, but rather it is a sacrament of our redemption by Christ's death insomuch that to such as rightly, worthily, and with faith receive the same, the bread which we break is a partaking of the body of Christ, and likewise the cup of blessing is a partaking of the blood of Christ. Transubstantiation, or the change of the substance of bread and wine, in the supper of the Lord, cannot be proved by holy writ, but is repugnant to the plain words of Scripture overthroweth the nature of a sacrament, and hath given occasion to many superstitions. The body of Christ is given, taken, and eaten in the supper only after an heavenly and spiritual manner, and the mean whereby the body of Christ is received and eaten in the supper is faith. The sacrament of the Lord's Supper was not by Christ's ordinance reserved carried about, lifted up, or worshipped. 29. Of the wicked, which eat not the body of Christ in the use of the Lord's Supper. The wicked, and such as be void of a lively faith, although they do carnally and visibly press with their teeth, as St. Augustus says, the sacrament of the body and blood of Christ, Yet in no wise are they partakers of Christ, but rather to their condemnation to eat and drink the sign or sacrament of so great a thing. 30. Of both kinds. The cup of the Lord is not to be denied to the lay people, for both the parts of the Lord's sacrament, by Christ's ordinance and commandment, ought to be ministered to all Christian men alike. 31. Of the one oblation of Christ finished upon the cross. The offering of Christ once made is that perfect redemption, propitiation, and satisfaction for all the sins of the whole world, both original and actual. And there is none other satisfaction for sin but that alone. Wherefore, the sacrifices of the masses in which it is commonly said that the priest did offer Christ for the quick and the dead to have remission of pain or guilt, were blasphemous fables and dangerous deceits. 32. Of the Marriage of Priests 
Bishops, priests and deacons are not commanded by God's law either to vow the estate of a single life or to abstain from marriage. Therefore it is lawful for them, as for all other Christian men, to marry at their own discretion, as they shall judge the same to serve better to godliness. 33. Of excommunicate persons, how they are to be avoided. That person which, by open denunciation of the church, is rightly cut off from the unity of the church and excommunicated, ought to be taken of the whole multitude of the faithful as an heathen and publican, until he be openly reconciled by penance, and received into the church by a judge that hath authority thereunto. 34. Of the Traditions of the Church It is not necessary that traditions and ceremonies be in all places one or utterly alike. For at all times they have been diverse, and may be changed according to the diversities of countries, times, and men's manners, so that nothing be ordained against God's word. Whosoever, through his private judgment, willingly and purposely doth openly break the traditions and ceremonies of the church, which be not repugnant to the word of God, and be ordained and approved by common authority, ought to be rebuked openly, that others may fear to do the like, as he that offendeth against the common order of the church, and hurteth the authority of the magistrate, and woundeth the consciences of the weak brethren. Every particular or national church hath authority to ordain, change and abolish, ceremonies or rites of the church, ordained only by man's authority, so that all things be done to edifying. 35. Of the Homilies The second book of Homilies, the several titles whereof we have joined under this article, does contain a godly and wholesome doctrine, and necessary for these times, as doth the former book of Homilies, which was set forth in the time of Edward the Sixth and therefore we judge them to be read in the churches by the ministers diligently and distinctly, that they may be understood by the people. Of the names of the homilies. 1. Of the right use of the church. 2. Against peril of idolatry. 3. Of repairing and keeping clean of churches. 4. Of good works, first of fasting. 5. Against gluttony and drunkenness. 6. Against excess of apparel. 7. Of prayer. 8. Of the time and place of prayer. 9. That common prayers and sacraments ought to be ministered in a known tongue. 10. Of the reverend estimation of God's word. 11. Of almsdoing. 12. Of the nativity of Christ. 13. Of the passion of Christ. 14. Of the resurrection of Christ. 15. Of the worthy receiving of the sacrament of the body and blood of Christ. 16. Of the gifts of the Holy Ghost. 17. For the rogation days. 18. Of the state of matrimony. 19. Of repentance. 20. Against idleness. 21. Against rebellion. 36. Of consecration of bishops and ministers. The Book of Consecration of Archbishops and Bishops and ordering of priests and deacons, lately set forth in the time of Edward the Sixth, and confirmed at the same time by authority of Parliament, does contain all things necessary to such consecration and ordering. Neither hath it anything that of itself is superstitious and ungodly. And therefore, whosoever are consecrated or ordered according to the rites of that book, since the second year of the forenamed King Edward unto this time, or hereafter shall be consecrated or ordered according to the same rites, we decree all such to be rightly, orderly, and lawfully consecrated and ordered. 37. Of the Civil Magistrates The King's Majesty hath the chief power in this realm of England, and other his dominions, 
unto whom the chief government of all estates of this realm, whether they be ecclesiastical or civil, in all causes doth appertain, and is not, nor ought to be, subject to any foreign jurisdiction. Where we attribute to the king's majesty the chief government, by which titles we understand the minds of some slanderous folks to be offended, we give not to our princes the ministering either of God's word or of the sacraments, the which thing the injunctions also lately set forth by Elizabeth our Queen do most plainly testify. But that only prerogative which we see to have been given always to all godly princes in holy scriptures by God himself, that is, that they should rule all estates and degrees committed to their charge by God, whether they be ecclesiastical or temporal, and restrain with the civil sword the stubborn and evildoers. The Bishop of Rome hath no jurisdiction in this realm of England. The laws of the realm may punish Christian men with death for heinous and grievous offences. It is lawful for Christian men, at the commandment of the magistrate, to wear weapons and to serve in the wars. 38. Of Christian men's goods which are not common. The riches and goods of Christians are not common as touching the right title and possession of the same, as certain Anabaptists do falsely boast. Notwithstanding, every man ought, of such things he possesseth, liberally to give alms to the poor according to his ability. 39. Of a Christian man's oath. As we confess that vain and rash swearing is forbidden Christian men by our Lord Jesus Christ and James's apostle, so we judge that Christian religion doth not prohibit but that a man may swear when the magistrate requireth, in a cause of faith and charity, so it be done according to the prophet's teaching, in justice, judgment, and truth. The Ratification This book of articles before rehearsed is again approved and allowed to be holden and executed within the realm by the assent and consent of our Sovereign Lady Elizabeth, by the grace of God, of England, France, and Ireland, Queen, Defender of the Faith, etc., which articles were deliberately read and confirmed again by the subscription of the hands of the Archbishop and Bishops of the Upper House, and by the subscription of the whole clergy of the Nether House in their convocation in the year of our Lord, 1571. End of the Articles End of Selections from the Book of Common Prayer, 1662, as approved by the Parliament of England.